started. So uh, everyone, welcome to the December 3rd, 2018 regular meeting of council. And Judy, if you could please call the roll. Yes, Housh. Yes, I'm McQueen. here. McQueen. Here. <laughs> Stokes. Here. Krieger. Here. Also present are village manager Patty Bates, solicitor Chris Connard, public works director Johnny Burns, and finance director Colleen Harris. All right, thank you, Judy. Uh, so our first item of business uh, is one uh, we're all very excited about, and uh, Kenneth Sanford, if you could come up, and also Mayor Canine, and uh, we're going to have a swearing in of our brand new council member. Next, we uh, have uh, any announcements? Um, Lisa? I do. I just want to um, mention again um, the utility roundup program. People who have been following, following us know that we've established a new program um, through which uh, members of the community can round up their utility bill to the nearest dollar or donate an additional amount to help community members out who are at risk of disconnection. Uh, we were listed on Giving Tuesday. We're hoping that we had some money um, come in on that, but we do need, if you can help us, community members, to consider rounding up to help community members, particularly with winter. Winter is coming. Thanks. <laughs> in, in relation to that, I do have an announcement. Um, uh, Late last week, we did receive word that we were given a grant from the Yellow Springs Community Foundation for $5,000 to go toward that program. Wow. So thank you, Community Foundation. Thank you, Community Foundation. That's great. All right. Any other announcements? I uh, do have one more. Well, go ahead. I'd like to do mine last. Okay. I would like to wish Councilperson Kevin Stokes a happy birthday later this week. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> See? Thank you. No. Okay. Yes. yes. A milestone. Wow. What, 40? <laughs> I thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 40 works for me. All right, cool. Um, I have three things. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to mention that this weekend, a couple exciting things going on. There's the gingerbread festival at Mills Lawn School from 11 to 2. And uh, on both the 8th and the 9th is the School Forest Festival, so make sure to get your Christmas tree out there. It's always a lot of fun. Um, December 12th, and we mentioned this last time, is going to be both the uh, dedication of the revamped Jungle Mur Mural, uh, as well as we're going to be awarding the VITA, Village Inspiration and Design Award, um, to the muralists of Yellow Springs. So. That's going to happen uh, again on December 12th. Um, we'll probably start gathering around 4.30. The ceremony will be at 5, and it's going to be at the Emporium. So there'll be hot drinks and holiday cookies. And uh, then following that, the, I know the Chamber's having their holiday party at the brewery and S&G Distillery. So if you haven't signed up for that, you should do that as well. Um, and then I want to say something uh, related to our last meeting, um, and in particular I want to talk about, uh, in the packet we included the council rules and procedures, and I, will I want to highlight two things. Um, 
first of all, I want to make it clear that ultimately our responsibility as council members is to the 3,700 plus community members in this village. Given that, we must uh, represent a lot of different issues and interests. And so it's very important that um, because of all the things we have to cover in our meetings, that as our rules say, that we maintain decorum and uh, we are respectful and that we follow those procedures. So to that extent, we're gonna make sure that things are tight, clean, and clear. So one thing that we will do is we will get that timer that hasn't been working fixed. So I've already talked to Judy about that. We will be very strict about three minutes, but I do wanna mention that three minutes is something that we try to do when we have plenty of time. There are times when we may give uh, less than three minutes and we will indicate that uh, as appropriate. Um, there's no charter guarantee of three minutes. And in fact, we've learned that a lot of councils don't allow for citizen concerns at all. We think it's very important that our citizens are participating in local government. So we will not change that, but we are going to tighten things up. The other thing I wanted to remind everyone of is in our rules and procedure, the president of council, me, is the presiding officer. So I'd ask that everyone uh, allow me to handle things in the meeting so that things uh, stay a little bit more organized. Um, and the last thing I guess I want to be clear about is council meetings are not a forum for addressing your personal issues with staff, with other council members. Um, since I'm the presiding officer, uh, I, I know things might be directed at me, but in general, um, that is not what this forum is about. There are plenty of other forums. We have village mediation, we have other opportunities, but this would be one example of something that if you read our rules and procedures carefully, those do not fit in this forum. However, bringing things to our attention about how we can improve any of the services that we deliver as a village is very important to us, and we wanna make sure that we keep hearing those things. So with that, um, let's go ahead and move into the consent agenda. We have uh, the minutes from our last meeting, November 19th, 2018, and I'll entertain a motion to approve. I move that we approve the minutes. I second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Aye. And uh, now we have a review of the agenda. Is there anything that we need to add or change? I have a question. The safe routes to school was in the packet, but is it on the agenda? We need to add that. Okay, so where? Um, we'll add that to new business uh, because Patty did request a vote on that. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? And um, another addition to new business, I'd like to, there's a handout in front of us to uh, talk about um, commission budget. Okay. Um, and that's a good one to talk about because there's a couple things there. Um, and then the last one, uh, or another one, is uh, Judy brought up the idea of potentially having a mini retreat even before the end of the year. Um, and I know, Kevin, you've said something about that too. So I'd like to talk briefly about that in new business as well. And I have two nominations for commission seats that okay. I'd like to bring forward. Great. Kevin, were you going to give an update on implicit bias? Sounds like you want me to. <laughs> yes, Kevin. Okay, I will. So I guess that would be old business. Okay, and everything else sounds like new business to me. Anything else? All right, great. Uh, Marianne, petitions and communications. Yes, we had a number of petitions and communications. Uh, we had a petition from Sean Pilecki Paulson regarding a proposed resolution uh, about police procedure at the New Year's Eve event. The Greene County Health Department uh, received accreditation by a national board that they felt very proud of. We had a mayor's court monthly report. Friends Care Center sent a general request for donations. The Ohio EPA had a discharge notice that I did not understand. Patty, did, it seemed to be about Clifton sewage. Yes. Yes. 
That's what it's about. Yes, that's what it's about. Okay, well, we received it. Um, Susan Stiles had a letter to Council and Planning Commission regarding the PUD process for the senior housing, proposed senior housing. Denise Swinger had a report on changes, recent changes in the zoning code that allow more flexibility for infill development. The clerk had a statement about meeting protocol and there was a safe routes to school. Well, that's going to be on the agenda, safe routes to school. And what wasn't in the, in the packet, but um, we did get at our table was, oh, okay, okay no, so there are two more. Uh, from um, Josh Knapp, uh, Sergeant Knapp, regarding security at the Bryan Center. Is that something we will talk about? It's in the manager's report. Mm -hmm. It's in the manager's okay. report. Okay. And then we have a memo from the chief of police regarding procedure at the New Year's Eve event. Do you want me to read that now? Or? Um, maybe just highlight what's okay. in bold. Okay. So th this report talks about what the time of the New Year's Eve event, which would be from 1130 on the 30th, 31st until 1 a.m. on January 1st. And then it, it discusses the role that the uh, staff will play from the fire department, that the role the police uh, department will play, and uh, basically to have a fun and safe community event on New Year's. Right, and this will be in the packet next time. Um, but again, just to highlight, uh, Chief Carlson has made a commitment that um, the roads will remain, or you know, downtown will remain closed from 11:30 p.m. to 1 a.m. So that is in writing and codified, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Let's move on to public hearings and legislation. And uh, first up, we have the second reading of Ordinance 2018-49, and. Judy, let's go ahead and read that in full, please. All right. This is enacting a new Chapter 290 entitled Justice System Commission of Title VIII Boards and Commissions of Part II Administration, Code of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas village officials have undertaken a review of the roles and responsibilities of the Justice System Task Force, which was created in 2016 to review and update the village justice system, and whereas it is Village Council's intent to codify its continued commitment to ongoing review <clears throat> and research of best practices for a fair, responsive, and forward-thinking village justice system, and whereas Village Council recognizes the importance of gathering and considering the experiences, insights, and professional opinion of those employees tasked with communicating and carrying out policy respective to enforcement and justice in the village, as well as that of qualified and committed citizens. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1, a new Chapter 290 Justice System Commission of Title VIII Boards and Commissions of Part II Administration Code of the Codified Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs is hereby enacted to read as set forth in Exhibit A, which is attached here to and incorporated herein. Section 2, this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Okay. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Okay. Um, I want to make a few clarifying comments, and then if there are any questions, and of course we'll open the public hearing after that. Um, first of all, uh, I want to mention, I, I've seen a lot of confusion um, on social media, uh, and, and I would remind people that social media is not the place to go if you want uh, facts. Um, so in particular, there's been a conflation between um, what we're doing with the Justice System Commission, which I'll explain in a minute, and uh, a citizen review board, which is a separate initiative, which has uh, been brought to us through the Justice System Task Force. Many citizens, including Sean, who's in the audience, uh, brought this to our attention. I know that Lisa's been working on that initiative, and that is a completely separate thing from the Justice System Commission. The goal of, just, of the Justice System Commission is to continue the work of the Justice System Task Force which had a two-year lifespan, and we have realized that because the work around po policing policy is so important, not just in Yellow Springs, but across the nation, we want to keep that capacity, and so we have made it a permanent commission. 
We'll talk later about who the council liaison and alternate will be for that. We're also going to be putting out a call for people that are interested in being on that commission. But that commission is about uh, taking directives from council to work on various policies that we need more vetting uh, and research for. Um, and one of those things could be helping us to understand the best practices around the citizen review board, as well as better research practices and those sorts of things. So I always want to make that distinction and I think I've explained the goals. Uh, do any council members have questions or comments? I have two. Yes, Marianne. Uh, one, in, uh, and I think Sean can speak for himself, but I told him that I would, I wasn't aware he was going to come, bring up his concern uh, regarding police uh, and mayor representative on the, on the justice system task force. I don't share that concern, but I can see that it might be possible at some point that the commission might want to have a, a session in which they invite people to come to talk about their concerns about the police, and they might say that they would prefer that the police and mayor representative might not be there. And I assume that that would be something that would be possible. Okay. Um, the other thing, the other concern that, that I have is in the ordinance, it talks about the procedure for making recommendations to village council. And I think it's important, especially with this commission, that they not get too far down the road before council knows what's happening. So really, before the commission even thinks about working on a recommendation, I think it would be a good idea to come to council and say, hey, we're thinking about making a recommendation about, let's say, Civilian review board. I know there's also already work been done, and have that have a discussion at council table to say, go for it, or we want some more information, or no way, or whatever, so, so that people aren't doing a lot of work on something and then coming back and finding that council is in a different place. So. And do you feel like the process that's been outlined in the? No, I don't think it says that. In, before making a recommendation, it lists all these things that need to be done, but it doesn't say anything about bringing an initial concept to council. Okay. If, if you changed the word make to propose under A, mm -hmm. would that resolve the yeah, issue? Yeah, that probably. Okay. Um, do you want to make a motion to do that now? or? Um, and you know that that being an exhibit, if you agree to the if you agree to the change that's fine the okay. ordinance can proceed it's not, it's not as part of the ordinance. Is that it's what you're as attached here too but it, it can be amended as long as it's not you know mm -hmm. dramatically substantive i think okay. we're fine okay i would also like to address some membership of the commission okay um i i've been the alternate to the justice system task force and so i i've been back into my minutes because i did attend as an alternate, you know, just because it's so important. And uh, I just want to bring forward that when um, this commission was discussed at the Justice System Task Force, there, there were a number of people that were part of that task force that were concerned about having um, the ex officio membership there all the time. Um, additionally, I think it, there's a possibility that there are um, other stakeholder groups that may have a perspective on this that, to the best of my knowledge, were not consulted. For example, the 365 group, who may have some perspectives and expertise on this topic. Um, I, I would think that it's important um, for the commission to meet occasionally um, without um, representatives of the system of power, if you will, the mayor and the police present. I don't know if I think it's better to have it just be at, at intervals that the commission meets separately or if at certain meetings they would just excuse those members and that those members would um, try to know that that isn't in any way a dislike or mistrust but that they just the commission would just like to speak privately without those members at that time. So I don't have a perfect 
solution of how to navigate it. But I would like that aspect of membership modified. Okay. Kevin, were you gonna? Well, yeah, I guess I would first wonder how much modification we're talking about. Um, let, me, let me read something here. Um, and many of us are familiar with the phrase or the term co-creation. Co-creation is a management initiative, and this is very generic. A management initiative or form of economic strategy that brings different parties together, for instance, a company and a group of customers, in order to jointly produce a mutually valued outcome. Co-creation brings a blend of ideas from direct customers or viewers who are not the direct users of the product, which in turn creates new ideas new ideas to the organization. <clears throat> so, and that can be, co-creation again as a general term is used heavily in uh, the medical field and I know there's been some information shared about co-creation of public safety. Um, in that this commission is not meant to judge or police the police or the mayor, um, what we in my estimation are doing and what I support is that we are creating a, an atmosphere where we can bring subject matter experts, just as the ordinance says, uh, to the table, bringing their experiences, their knowledge, you know, that expertise, again, the subject matter experts. Um, I mean, when you talk about uh, co-creation of public safety, well, you, we might even want to bring the, the chief of the fire marshal uh, in as well not suggesting that, but in that, again, we're talking about bringing all of the parties to the table, all the stakeholders to the table to create something that's mutually beneficial for all parties involved. I can imagine that there will be some instances that are the exception when someone might feel that I'm going to bring up something sensitive and I'd like not to, you know, to have the people I'm talking about in the room. Um, we, we can debate that. Uh, so I am not interested in creating a, a mechanism that seems to be designed to police or oversee the police, but I am interested in, in supporting an ordinance that creates this culture of co-creation where there's not too many more people that know much more about public safety and the things that we're asking the chief of police, uh, the village manager, and the mayor to be responsible for than those individuals. So um, I think they absolutely ought to be involved. And again, I will allow that there could be some instances where we might ask them to step out uh, temporarily but I expect them to have uh, just as much, not from a voting perspective, but from a content uh, and expertise perspective as almost anyone else in the room. Okay, Lisa? Yeah, I'd like to respond. So um, in my life in corporate, corporate life, um, I've spent quite a, quite a bit of time doing this kind of co-creation work that you describe with, with products and organizations and services, and I do understand the importance of that. Um, what I do know also is that before that co-creation can effectively occur, that there needs to be a, a trust relationship between the stakeholders. And I'm very committed in my work on council to doing all that I can to build uh, trust between the community and our police department and um, to have that just grow and get better over time but I think we're not there yet. And I think that to always say that those ex officio members must be present um, is to um, negate the perspectives that I've heard from community members where they may feel uh, uh, afraid even or a lack of trust. I think we need to create a safe environment where sometimes those members are not present. And so I don't think it's very big of a change Actually, I do agree that they would serve as ex officio members. The only thing that's not specified in the ordinance is the frequency or the mandate for them to attend. 
as ex officio members. I think I, we agree because I did hear you say that sometimes they might not be present. Mm -hmm. But again, that, in my opinion, should be the exception. And I guess I will just add, I mean, we do have mechanisms such as uh, citizens can, you know, approach a member of a commission and talk to them and share something. Uh, they can do that, of course, with council members as well. Um, I guess the other thing is, I, you know, I don't know if an uh, executive session, if there was some kind of, you know, special situation, huh. that's a mechanism that you have under Robert's rules. Um, so, I mean, it seems like we have things in place that could cover that, um, but, but I think it's good to recognize that there could be some situations we might not be thinking of. Patty? Um, so it's my understanding that one of the reasons that Judith um, Hempfling suggested that the mayor, the chief, and myself, or our representatives be ex officio members was because of some of the issues that we had had vetting particular policies before they came to council. Mm -hmm. So while I have advocated from the very beginning of the Justice System Task Force for that to happen so that we wouldn't you know, make progress and then have to go backwards, I think that if the Justice System Commission is working on a particular policy at a meeting or if there's a subgroup working on a particular policy, then I think it is absolutely appropriate for the three of us to be there. I fully understand that some citizens may not wish to express personal experiences or concerns with any of the three of us sitting there. And I'm sure that we could in some way, when we're working on an agenda for this commission, find a way to accommodate all of those things. Whether it be that you know citizens' concerns come in the beginning of the meeting so that if, if you wish to express a concern to the committee, uh, say the meeting starts at 7, you'd be there at 7, and perhaps the three of us don't arrive until 7.30 or 8 o'clock, whatever seems appropriate at, at the time. Okay. Just, a, just a thought. Okay. Um, Kenetta, did you want to weigh in on anything before I open the public hearing? Um, I'm okay. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, yes, so we are now open the public hearing since this is second reading. Person never showed up because they're very busy people. They have a lot of work to do. And, you know, each of you being parts of different commissions and committees understand that there's times when you just can't do it, especially if you're really just going to sit there. So um, that's very common that they don't show up. But one thing that does happen, which I think is a risk and something that needs to be considered by the commission as it goes forward, is the person who shows up and takes over. And this is not totally unusual. In other words, that, uh, as an example, you can read the minutes of the Oxford Police uh, Advisory Board, where what happens is that the police chief basically does all the talking, mostly reports in, very useful reporting. We had these break-ins, we had this happen, that happen. But basically, they pretty much, you know, they're not always the most humble people. I think our chief is, but, and I think our manager is, but <laughs> they know a lot and they can't help themselves from telling everybody what the truth is or what's really how things work. So I think the commission, um, I think it's, useful and the reason that the, that the task force wanted to go forward with a representative from the police department is in our justice system task force the seven or eight or nine people um, e many people working on different kinds of issues researching uh, policies not having a police representative we ended up with lots of drop-in meetings scheduled meetings phone calls and it was it got to be a hassle. I mean, basically, it interrupted the work of, of the department sometimes, sometimes, not always. So it is useful to have that person, but I think that the commission does, and you've, all of you have brought forward some of these concerns, that it has to be very clear, both in the charge to the commission and in the commission, and those representatives who are coming as non-voting members, just what is their role, and so that's the story. All right. Thank you, Pat. Uh, any other comments? Yes. Hi, my name is Corey White. 
I'm not opposed to having police in the commission. I don't think anyone has any need to be afraid of the police in Yellow Springs here in that situation. I do think it would be nice if um, we put careful thought into which police officer would be best suited for the job. I think Officer Meister would be great. Nothing against any of the other police, but he seems to be able to really connect and relate to the community. And uh, that's what we need. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. Sean? Excuse me. Hard time bending over uh, to the microphone, if you excuse me. Um, so, <clears throat> Paul Shank was shot in his home after calling the police by the police. And that's why we're here in this conversation today. The Justice System Commission was set up after he uh, was, was killed. And the person pulling the trigger was a public, was a village member, village government member, a, p a police officer. And so now we're looking at taking the justice system task force to the justice system commission, um, revamping it to a permanent commission from a temporary commission, which is pro a, a good a good step uh, to do. Uh, certainly more work needs to be done, but the essential function was to address a, a deep problem that we had here in this village, uh, that we still have uh, in this village. You know, it, our work is not done. And um, so when we're talking about having a uh, police on the commission, and I think mayor uh, also fits in the same category, you know, the, it's, it's important that we not create this, this uh, ethical issue of the, the police um, having the, the role where they're always present uh, and, and there's no separation between them and the, the discussion um, on how to reform them and how to make them better. Certainly we need consultation. I suggest um, every third month um, that they they are there, and the other times they aren't. So there's a back and forth between consultation and deliberation outside of uh, their immediate um, vicinity. Uh, now you could you could do that every other time, uh, have them there, and, and every other time have them not there. Uh, but some process for which that you know whether it's for the sake of victims being able to testify at the uh, you know give public comment or whether it's uh, just simply for the value of the people on the uh, commission to be able to deliberate, um, you know, put forward ideas without the fear of, oh, is the police going to give me a ticket next time I see them? Uh, if I keep pushing this, this idea that they keep shooting down, which I think is a really good idea. Uh, you know, these are very real considerations. And, and so, um, you know, I do hope that, uh, <clears throat> Uh, that the council does consider uh, um, making a, a adjustment in this uh, creation of the Justice System Commission so that uh, these concerns don't result in judgment down the road from a failed commission. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Any other citizen comments? Okay, I, I do want to emphasize one other thing and then we'll, I guess, figure out how we're going to proceed. Um, I think the other thing that we need to remember is that the leadership of the commission is very important, both the council liaison and the chair in making sure that uh, the goals are achieved um, of this and really any commission. Um, so with that, uh, what are we... Yes, I have Lisa. one other tiny yeah. comment and that's that I didn't see that the ordinance men mentioned the presence of an alternate. And I, I just thought that was interesting. Mm. The did, I, did I miss it? Oh, the, yeah, the, the exhibit A? Alternate? Yeah, a council alternate. Uh, if, if that was taken out, it, it, it's just a little it, yeah, it yeah. shouldn't be, because it, it should be it's standard language. So. Yeah, it's at, at 29.02B, uh -huh. maybe I think is where it should go. OK, yeah. So, small so thing, but. It might have gotten in some of the edits taken out, but it, it is part of our standard ordinance. Yeah, it's not in there. Um, so, uh, well, I guess I'll ask council, I mean, are we 
Is there a motion to amend this? Are we bringing this back um, after it's worked on a little bit more? Uh, I think Pat makes a really interesting and important point, which is very characteristic of Pat. <laughs> um, and that is that you can swing both directions in with ex officio members, both a, a, an over participation or, or silencing the participants or an under participation. So I, I, I'm concerned that if we get to into editing this, we could have both things. I think, I mean, I know that I wouldn't, I wouldn't go anywhere near approving this if these members, the village manager, or representative from the police, and, and the mayor weren't involved. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely important. So, I mean, I, I think we could get, we would waste time by spending too much time editing. So long as whoever is the council liaison understands the intent that we've discussed mm -hmm. and that there has to be some bracketed time where those individuals are not present. And I, I think we all agree to that. I've heard lots of different ways it might happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I heard one uh, suggestion to change make to propose. Um, and we need, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. And then we need to make sure that language uh, about the council alternate is in there. So I'll entertain a motion to, um, yes. Yeah. So I'm wondering if, if we should um, make, strengthen how the justice system reports back to <coughs> council on a monthly basis. Um, I mean, if we keep, Clearly, there are pros and cons of having uh, these ex officio members there, and it partly depends on who the who comes and just the dynamics. But if we were to have regular good reporting, and maybe directly from the council liaison to the council president, even people, I mean, if there were problems that arose, because it's not the kind of thing you want to say in a council meeting, well, the chief of police dominated the meeting. <laughs> no, we don't mind it. But some kind of way of keeping tabs on how it's functioning. Okay. So are you, what are you thinking then? Um, well, I'm not sure where that would get, where that would fit. <laughs> Where, where does it talk about the reporting out? Does it have a... Um, well, I... Yeah. I it, and you could. I mean, you certainly could put that there. I wonder, though, if you could be anticipating a problem that might never occur. And we have sort of an ebb and flow with every board and commission where there are times when relations on that commission or interaction on the commission is more difficult than others, and then that all sort of goes away and everything goes well. I mean, it, it does ebb and flow. I don't know if you want to codify. Well, there is, uh, there is something in the ordinance, which is in all our ordinances, which allows for um, creating rules for that particular commission mm -hmm. to make sure that it functions as it needs to. So, I mean, with the things that council has talked about, this could be a directive that that be one of the first things that this commission does is think about those procedures, make a recommendation to council, and bring those back. Okay, and that would be done separately. Yeah. So I guess that's the question: is you know, are, are we going to have a motion to pass the ordinance with the two amendments, or are we going to table this? Well, I'll make a motion to pass the ordinance with the two amendments. Okay. Second. All right. Uh, Judy, can you call the roll, please? Yes. McQueen. Yes. Sanford. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Housh. Yes. And I do want to say I appreciate great mm -hmm. discussion. Yes. Thank you for the feedback. I think that will make it an even stronger commission, and we want it to be a success. All right. Uh, next, we have the first reading of Ordinance 2018-50. Uh, and uh, Judy, you can do that by title only. All right. And this is approving the 2019 annual appropriations and declaring an emergency, Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh, can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. 
Okay. Um, is this Colleen? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we're getting to that point where we're closing in on the budget. I think we've worked really hard. I'm very proud of it. So if there's any questions, I did add everything that we talked about at the last meeting. The ordinance does have by fund totals that match the Excel and the paper copies that came out with the uh, few changes that we had from the last meeting. So I just entertain any questions. And, um, the changes that were made in the enterprise funds, which were, that, that was as a result of our last meeting's discussion. Some of the changes in the enterprise fund were to um, take out some of the balance yes. and we moved it into the capital okay. for the enterprise right. funds. Then we also, that is where we'll pay for those projects out of the capital um, funds. Okay. I saw where it was taken out. I wasn't, I wasn't quite clear where it got built in. Yeah. In the capital. Yeah, it's in the capital. It's, and you don't, you don't, you didn't see that in your packet because um, there was a little problem with the tabs on the PDF. But um, it, you saw it taken out because you had, the, you had the enterprise operating. But you didn't have the capital funds, which is where it got moved ah, okay. into. Okay, is that on our table? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, well, I mean, since we since you asked that question, I think it might be why Johnny's here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we brought up last time is that we wanted to right size our funds, and um, the the largest transfer is with the electric fund, and uh, one of the things that I asked for is some assurance that we would be spending, and, and Lisa said this too, current tax dollars on current projects. And so, Johnny, maybe you could speak a little bit to what we're looking at over the next five years um, since we are moving more into the uh, electric capital fund. Let me see. And, and mind you, what we have in the budget for the next five years is just like an overview. Mm -hmm. And I still have a lot more in my office on the big tall sheet. <clears throat> so over the next uh, years, it looks like we got GIS mapping going on, <clears throat> blacktopping of the <clears throat> excuse me of the switch station uh, alley and uh, uh, alley maintenance with pole change outs as well, um, reclosures. Uh, for the next five years, and that's not going to get them all. There's, mm -hmm. they're $25,000 a piece, and we have uh, seven sets that need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, LED, LED street lighting, which we actually placed uh, one of the first orders uh, today, uh, that is ongoing. Uh, tornado siren in two years is what we had, but we'd like to move it back to next year if possible. Uh, that's the one at Keese Alley that needs totally rehabbed. That's about $40,000. That's a, today's prices. Um, and then some repairs that need to be done at Sutton Farm, but we have a lot that needs to be done, a lot of poles that need to be changed out. We actually now have a full staff on the electric crew, and we did get quite a bit of them, and we'll be continuing to do so. Uh, but then as development happens, we're going to have to start making some upgrades to the electric system, but there's a lot to be done. Okay. And, and, it and we are on a positive track to getting it done. So we have the capacity to do <clears throat> these projects. Okay. Yep. What, what about the third line? Uh, third circuit. We are still investigating that. We actually did not receive any uh, electrical contracting. <gasps> uh, engineering. Engineering. Directions. So we're going to reach out to maybe like the city of Piqua and some other local communities that maybe have some engineers to be able to come in and help us so out. So that isn't included in the that is not. budget yet? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, any other questions for Johnny? It's on the radar. It's not out of the, it's just not in black and white yet. And then, I mean, we also have that goal to do an electric system study. Correct. Which Absolutely. could tell us a lot more. Right. Correct. And, okay. and did you not say, Johnny, at one point, that excuse me, if the study was done, it might not necessarily mean it needs to be a. That that's correct. There may be another way that they see us to split up the circuits that we got, and not actually put in the third circuit. But I don't see it. Okay. But anything's possible. Right. All right. Okay. 
right. So, Lisa? Yeah, I, I just want to thank you and your team and Patty and, and you <laughs> twice. Um, <laughs> Because not only have, do you have the expertise about what's going on in the village above and below the streets, but you've done a great job at educating the council Appreciate and helping us to come along and understand. And I hope similarly that the, also the community's listening because these numbers are big. Yeah. And when people in the community see those numbers and the funds, it's really easy to say, well, they're like rolling in the cash there. But then when you look at these projects that are so important to the safety and uh, quality of life in the village, you see how much they cost. And so your education has been really helpful. So thank you. Well, let me just mention one thing that I, I believe I told Judy or Patty, one or the other. But uh, even for like the one little bit of ice storm that we had to knock out about 300 homes mm. uh, out of my budget was about $45,000 like that mm -hmm. in a matter of about three hours so I was able to get it but that was just a small ice storm so it, I want to make sure that we're due diligence with the money to where we have that also for emergencies like that mm -hmm. because I mean if we, if we go back six years ago that was a major ice storm but uh, we was able to get the POs out there and get cleanup started and, and got everything back up and running. So, okay. Thanks, Thanks John. Um, I think it's also good to highlight here that the, we do not, we're not seeing any more increases in the electric rates, just the readiness for service, That's right? That's correct. Okay. Which is an additional dollar a month. So electric increases, have essentially been completed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Colleen. Yeah, were you going to say? Yeah. So, I just want to remind um, council and some of the new ones that our budget passing at the next council meeting, hopefully, um, does allow us to operate January one. So, um, if there are any questions or concerns um, that we haven't already addressed in all the meetings. Um, please get with Patty, myself, email, phone call. I, I'm here all the time. But I just want to make sure that we can have something pass. It's a good budget. It's a conservative budget. Um, it has a lot of room, again, for the, the repairs, and, um, and we need it for January 1. Yeah, and, and I, it's been a great process. And, uh, you know, kudos to you, Colleen. Thank you. you know, uh, yeah, it's been a lot of work. Um, and, and, and I do want to say she is here all the time. I cannot get her to go home. <laughs> I will um, when we're done. <laughs> yes. Well, I do have one other thing okay. uh, for, for that I wanted to ask about, and it's the uh, Economic Development Fund. Sure. So I'm a little bit unclear when I, when I look at it. Um, okay, so we – I know initially we talked about that we had – 90 something thousand in that fund and, and now I'm seeing 82 and so I'm, I just guess I want to understand the fund balance um, the fund balance started at 143 if I can even read this without my glasses uh -huh. um, and then after our last discussion we talked about home Inc. for 30,000 and uh, Glen Cottage um, another 30,000 and that's appropriated that's uh -huh. that's in there to um, to have the authority to spend next year. Mm -hmm. The state grant also uh, needs to be I'm spent. So, so that so that's coming out of the economic development fund, the homing. Is that what you're saying? The yes. There's thirty thousand on homing. Now not the um, professional services for let me look at this. There's thirty thousand for the comprehensive plan mm -hmm. out of the economic Oh, okay. For that. Yeah. Okay. It's just um, it needs some new account numbers, but that's what that was from the last meeting. Um, and where is that reflected? On page six in the <coughs> special revenue funds, and fund two hundred five. Economic that's what I'm development. At. It's highlighted as sixty thousand. We talked about, um, let's see, the glass farm is out of the general fund. The 30,000 comprehensive plan is out of the economic development. That's 30. 
and it was um, talked about the right. home ink and 20,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I'm looking at that. Um, yep, that's, I mean, that's what I'm looking at. Um, okay, so the, the 30,000 for Glass Farm, where, where is that? 30,000 for Glass <coughs> Farm. I just heard you say that. It's 20,000 and it's under the General Fund Professional Services Administrative it got moved into my professional services mm -hmm. budget. Okay. And it came out of the green space fund, which is right below that where you're looking at. Where that little box mm -hmm. is. So the, the thirty thousand glass farm came out of the green space the, fund. The fifty thousand dollars that um, was council decided not to put into the green space fund, but to reallocate oh, okay, other places. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Did we decide that the sixty thousand for the Glen Cottage project was going to come out of the economic development fund? That's what I had in my notes from the last meeting, which I did not bring with me now today, but. I don't remember. I mean, I, I remember a lot of conversation about creating that new fund. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. recall. So that's, that's what my notes had. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we actually have it on the community development line, uh, particularly. Yes. Um, all right. I mean, that's not what I had in my notes, but it, I mean, it, is council okay with that? Is that? What did you have in your notes as an alternate? Just curious. <coughs> I didn't think we had specified where it came from, actually. Let's see, I've got how she coming in, but the requested 30000 for a comprehensive plan for yes. Salton would come out of the economics. So that's yes. 30000 of it. Right, I remember that. Okay, and then. Um, Glen Cottage, 20,000 Glass Farm, that's out of the general fund. And then the other, compre yeah, the comprehensive plan, that's a duplicate. With Glen, the Glen Cottages Glen is what we're talking about for Home Inc. And that's under the general fund, professional services out of yours, that 20,000. Okay. So then I think the 60,000 line, I mean, I, I don't remember 30. talking about that. I, <coughs> Cottages is 30. It'll be 30. Yeah. 30 over two years, right? No, no. no. 30, 30, 30, 30 the first two year, two year. 30 and, next and year, 30. And we only 30 did the one year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, two thirties. Yeah. Right, two thirties is what I meant to say. Um, hmm. So. Well, I, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, the reason why I'm being nitpicky is because we have some things that we flagged for economic development, right. and I'm just not sure that we want to slash that fund. So, Colleen, the, the, the 50000 that was reallocated from the Green Space Fund, 20000 of it went into my professional services line mm -hmm. for the Glass Farm. And the other 30 is in this? The other economic. 30 went into economic development, and you, then in expenditures you took it back out. So that should be 30000 Well, I didn't put it in as a revenue source. We were using fund balance. Okay, so I think council wants it to go in as a revenue source and then come out. The 20 or the 30? The 30,000. 30. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't actually deplete. So it'll get transferred from the general fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the general fund will get reduced by 30, it'll go into the economic development as a revenue source out. and then right. come back yeah. out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then the other thing, and it was on my radar at the last meeting, but um, we have 40,000 in the revolving loan fund, but the amount that we really have was like 32 something. So I'd rather make that 35,000 than 40, because we don't really know what's gonna happen with the revolving loan fund yet. So that would just be my, I mean, I, I don't see why we're bouncing it up to 40, because we had 32 something in there. So. We were gonna take 10 out, weren't we? For using now and right. the rest for right. the ten. Right. So yeah. you you want it to be there and available but not allocated for any 
particular purpose. Right. But I think it's instead, in the, it's not in the appropriations. Right. It's True. In the but program. but we have a note that says forty, and just right. just to stay where we were at, I'd rather make that thirty-five. And then I promise that's all I have. That's fine, but I think I've already moved that off my note. I'll make sure you have the right. <coughs> and so it's just staying in the fund balance. It's right, but market. just change that note to thir we have thirty-five, 35 available. There. Okay. Right. But we're, we haven't appropriated any yet, that's right. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. Any other well, questions? I, I have a question, yes. Uh, we also have that we're voting on creating an affordable housing line item, mm -hmm. which is, as you probably remember, I think is premature. But if it's going to happen, then why wouldn't the home ink money go into that fund? Because we. We still have to go through the process of creating the fund, the fund, and that won't happen until next year. Right. So we'll just we'll have the fund sitting there, but no money in in it until we put it in there. Right. Okay. So I have just two, and they're just comments as far as the budget's concerned that I want to keep in council's head. Um, one involves the the state grant, which is in the economic development fund um, that the county is giving us. Um, uh, Brian and I are going tomorrow night to the ceremony for that. Um, it's $22,084, and um, Johnny and I have been talking about where this money could potentially be spent. It has to be spent before October of next year, and it has to be on a permanent infrastructure improvement. Mm -hmm. And we would like to recommend to council that that money be used to um, complete the engineering to potentially make Beatty Hughes Park a parking lot. Special um, and I know that there was discussion in the past about doing this, and there was an understanding that there was a prohibition against doing that because uh, Beatty Hughes was established with a HUD grant. Mm -hmm. But that pro prohibition was lifted in 19, I think, 88, according to the memo that is in the file. Mm -hmm. um, so Beatty Hughes is very underused as a park. You rarely see anyone there. Um, it's, it's right, it's got a sidewalk going past it so it would safely get folks up into downtown and um, we would like to recommend that that money be used toward that purpose. And I'm saying this now because Colleen would have to know where to put that money and receipt it in. Johnny, did you want to? Yeah, I actually got an email before I left and the actual engineering uh, for that is almost 18000 So. Uh, I, I not sure that I, I, I don't support that without further discussion. Because if we're going to open up Beatty Hughes for something else, and I agree, it doesn't, I don't think it gets used much, that I think we need to look at the various options that we might have. But I, I'm not for, I'd rather not spend money on an engineering study until we decide we want to really have parking. Right, and I understand, but I'm just talking about for the purposes of what Colleen needs to do in her budget, budget with, without a without a supplemental appropriation having to go through in order to complete it. I I wouldn't support that without additional discussion either. I think there's ways that the community may have perspective about the use of that park, and I know we need more parking, but. I think we need to talk about it more. But you need to have some place to put this money. I have it in um, just special revenue. under um, the economic development mm -hmm. under the state grant receipt. Okay. We just have it assigned an account number mm -hmm. as to what purpose. But that's I can do an account number because it's in the economic fund we already have. Okay. I have every confidence that we will find something to spend that money on. <laughs> Okay, so we can. So we don't need to decide that. We can just put it in that fund. If, if you can't decide, well, I'm okay. just putting it in the fund okay, as an good. appropriation because we have to spend it next year. All right. But we have the year to change it. Okay, so that's what we'll do. And the second thing is um, that I want you to be aware that um, there we will be adding one person to the village staff. It is already in this budget, so I'm not asking you to change anything about the budget but to do with the EPA mandate that we have someone at the plants um, X number of hours a day, um, we don't have enough staff to comply with that mandate. So there, that fourth person for the water and wastewater treatment staff is in the budget already, and I just wanted to make council aware of that because we will be putting out that advertisement. Okay. Thank you. Great. 
Uh, any other questions or comments about the budget? Okay, and so just for my clarification, the only thing that I heard to change is the transfer thirty thousand out of the general fund into the economic development fund to be used for home use. Right, right, okay. and it'll be specifically in that community development line. Okay, as you reflected it. Okay, Thank um, you. and. Uh, we are reading that we are declaring an emergency on this, but we will still have a second reading. But the reason for declaring an emergency is that can, it can go into effect in 30 days. Uh, well, immediately. Oh, well, immediately. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Immediately. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, Judy, could you do the roll call, please? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Sanford? Yes. Housh? Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, first reading of ordinance 2018-51. Uh, Judy, you can do that by title only. Wait, what? Sorry about that. that right. is a, this is approving creation of a fund for the furtherance of affordable housing in the village of Yellow Springs. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Okay. Um, so, uh, just to recap, this is uh, a reflection of something that Judith brought up, that our budget should highlight the values of the village. It, it, there's a process to set up a new fund, which requires submitting it to state auditor. state auditor. That takes a little bit of time. Um, having the fund there does not mean that you know, we can do with it what we want, and we would make that decision uh, in the next year or in the future. Um, any questions or comments about this? Okay. Um, questions or comments from citizens? All right. If not, oh, yes, please. I just want to thank the council for uh, giving the $60,000. Um, and I want to thank them for choosing Canetta. I think that you've made some very wise decisions. And I think there's been so much talk about affordable housing. And since I've been here for 10 years, there was always senior housing on the agenda. It never happened. And it's so good to know that something maybe will happen. And I have to say maybe, because every time it comes up, it always seems to disappear. But it looks like it might happen this time. So thank you. And I'm sorry, can you give your name? We oh, want to sorry. make sure everyone uh, does Patricia that. Brown. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Uh, yes, uh, th that will be coming in a minute. So, um, any other questions or comments? All right, if not, Judy, let's go ahead and do the roll call, please. Yes, Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. McQueen. Abstain. Sanford. Yes. Housh. Yes. And there will be a second reading at our next meeting. Uh, and finally, resolution 2018-42. Uh, Judy, if we could read that in full, please. <clears throat> okay, this is affirming the village of Yellow Springs as a welcoming community for all persons, regardless of country of origin, ethnicity, age, gender identity, sexual orientation, income, ability, or religion. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs identifies itself as a welcoming community of opportunity for people of any race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, culture, income, ability, or religion. And whereas the village of Yellow Springs has long prohibited discrimination based on race, color, ethnicity, national origin, or other protected characteristics in the provision of its services and intends to continue to make its services available to all its residents regardless of their federal immigration status. And whereas the United States is a country founded by immigrants and enhanced by the co contributions of immigrants, and whereas every U.S. citizen with the exception of Native American citizens is descended from immigrants, and whereas the current President of the United States and his administration are instituting draconian tactics of rounding up and deporting undocumented immigrants and arbitrarily prohibiting others from entering the country, and whereas it is particularly essential to the mission of the village's emergency services departments that victims report crimes or injuries, cooperate fully in investigations, and summon help when needed, and whereas no other village department inquires into the immigration status of individuals before making government services available to that individual,
And whereas enforcement of federal immigration laws is the prerogative of federal enforcement agencies, not local law enforcement agencies, and whereas the threat of deportation or prosecution for no reason other than immigration status may discourage residents without legal immigration status or who have family members or friends without legal immigration status from reporting crimes or injuries, cooperating in investigations, seeking opportunities for their children or for their children living in this community, or summoning help when needed. And whereas federal law does not require local law enforcement or other local service providers to inquire into an individual's immigration status or respond to federal immigration and customs enforcement detainer requests. So the principles of sanctuary cities are not inconsistent with federal law. And whereas these practices are generally considered to be sanctuary city policies, now, therefore, be it, res be it resolved by the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, that Section 1, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, supports and encourages local and regional efforts to welcome and offer sanctuary to immigrants and others who are being targeted on the basis of religion, nationality, culture, gender identity, race, or citizenship status. Section 2, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, is committed to the protection of law-abiding village residents and visitors from abuse, harassment, and harm, regardless of their immigration or refugee status. Section 3, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, directs that no village department may use village funds, equipment, or personnel for the sole purpose of detecting or apprehending persons based on their suspected immigration status unless in response to a court order. In furtherance of this policy, no village officer or employee shall request information about or otherwise investigate or assist in the investigation of a person's immigration status unless a criminal warrant exists, a criminal violation was reported, or an arrest was made. Section 4, no village department or employee shall deny equal access to village services based on immigration status <coughs> unless required by law or court order. Such denial of access shall include but not be limited to soliciting immigration status in any application for village services, predicating the provision of services on the immigration status of any person, or delaying the provision of services based solely on immigration status. Section 5, it shall be the policy of the Village of Yellow Springs to vigorously oppose any effort to require the use of local taxpayer resources for the enforcement of federal immigration policy. Objected against discrimination based on that. In Section 2, uh, which talks about protecting uh, village residents, I also added visitors. And then in Section 3, the last full line, uh, it, it says uh, that they cannot be, uh, they won't, let's see, they won't investigate unless there is a criminal warrant. And we included the word criminal because ICE issues warrants, which are different than those issued by the police. So those are the three changes. Uh, there are, I think there's also a typo um, in section three on the second line. The next to the last word, I think should, there should be an on based on suspected immigration status? There were a few typos. I'll, I'll run okay. through it. Okay, thanks. So um, those are the changes from the last. Um, <clears throat> before, I guess, a lot of, or any publicity comes out about uh, this proposed state bill, I wonder if Patty or Chris wanted to speak to how well this has been vetted uh, with regard to that, or are we no, we, we asked Chris last time to mm -hmm. tell us about any exposure that the village yeah, would I, have. I, I talked with Chris. Also, I should say that Patty w really did the initial work on this, so mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome. Chris? We're good. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, so now you know. <laughs> so, and then the only other thing is I asked at the last meeting that we add political affiliation because I think when, when we're thinking about these, oh, where do you, where were you? we would need to add it in the title, in the first whereas, and in section one. You're going to get a long whereas, some long whereas, huh? Yeah. So. But it just to be consistent. You mean after religion? Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can go anywhere. Um, uh, so, any other questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? All right. Um, yeah, Pat? Um, just a brief note of appreciation. I think there is a, a perception that there's some risk in standing up to what is happening in terms of the abuses um, 
of immigrants, and I appreciate the fact <coughs> that um, the council has responded with seriousness and consideration, and um, I feel it's just an ongoing commitment of this council to make sure that our community is a safe community and a welcoming community. So I deeply, deeply appreciate that. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, I also want to say, and I, and I think we've said this before, that I believe this is an important stand for us to take. I also want to highlight that our police department is already following these practices. I recently heard a story um, that uh, made me very happy about the way our officers uh, treat these kinds of situations, and, uh, and that's what Yellow Springs is all about. Um, so I'd like to make a motion. Yeah, Sean, please. Yeah, I just want to um, <clears throat> voice my uh, support for this uh, resolution. I think it's very important that we are a welcoming community, and I think that um, you know it's important that we continue this uh, stand uh, b beyond uh, this resolution. Uh, I think our work is not done as long as people who come to this country can be determined to be uh, in violation of the criminal code if they enter uh, without filing the, the proper paperwork. Uh, the institution uh, as um, a criminal offense for people who enter without the proper paperwork was uh, brought uh, to, to the um, law uh, out of racism. Uh, clear, clear um, th there, was, there was race riot, uh, there was um, rather um, uh, yeah, there, there were, there were. Uh, what, what, what would you say when? The, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing the word. But the when uh, uh, non-white folks were attacked, uh, pogroms, I guess. Uh, you know, and and out of that climate, uh, that that was that was how uh, this was instituted. So, you know, we need to continue to push forward until we can remove um, from the criminal code the the jet the. Um, identification of these people, these folks as criminal. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, so I would like to make a motion to uh, approve uh, with the addition of political affiliation and correcting the grammatical error based on, is there a second? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, now is the time in the agenda where we will take comments about things that are not specifically on the agenda. That is citizen concerns. We ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. And I know, Marnie, you had uh, something you wanted to share, so if you want to come up. really uh, aware of everyone in this village and um, what their complaints are and over the years there have been a lot more people complaining that they can't sleep. Um, I'm here to specifically talk about the electric smart meters. Um, recently I had no idea about these things. Um, from what I understood from doing a lot of research is that we were supposed to be kind of notified and educated about these smart meters and given an option to opt out of a smart meter, whether you're a, a property owner or a renter. Um, I never heard anything about any s opt out. I just know that probably about the same time these were um, changed out, I know that my bill skyrocketed at my shop. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna try to, I know I only have a couple minutes, but. Um, I want to play something quickly for you. Um, a lot of people are all over the place. Are thousands and thousands and thousands of people are having problems with these meters. They are very dangerous. They are 100 to 160 times more dangerous than a cell phone. And what they do is they um, do pulses through the electrical wiring of the homes. And whether you can hear them or not, there is a frequency, and I hope this is, is not too loud, but someone actually recorded this frequency. That's it. So some people are saying they have tinnitus. Tinnitus actually comes from inside the body, not from outside the body, and these smart meters are emitting this tone. Where I live, I rent, there are two smart meters on the house, two smart meters spacing, with just like maybe 10, 10, 15 feet away from a driveway. From what I understand, these things 
emit radiation 90 feet each one. Um, and they are considered a 2B carcinogen um, classified by the World Health Organization. Um, I was having problems sleeping. Um, I've had migraines with vomiting more, re more frequently over the last year or so, not realizing I didn't know anything about smart meters um, until I started looking, you know, about this noise I was hearing because I laid down to sleep a couple weeks ago and I realized that isn't just, you know, sometimes we get tones that come and go in our ears naturally. And I don't have any health problems and per perfectly healthy. And I realized that this noise was not going away. And I looked online and sure enough, this has been a big thing all over the world since um, 2010. That's as far as, far back I, as I could find information. Um, but these things spike through the walls thousands of times a day and they're very dangerous. Um, <coughs> they cause heart palpitations, insomnia, tinnitus, difficulty thinking, memory problems, um, rashes, nosebleeds, visual problems, eye pain. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I'm just going to, instead of focusing on how dangerous and how harmful these are. So, Marty, that was three minutes. Um, can I just say one quick thing? I'm here to ask to enact my right. Um, the uh, Ohio Code 49011-10-05 about metering states that um, an electric company shall provide con uh, con customers with the option to remove an installed advanced meter, which is a digital meter, and replace it with a traditional meter, an analog like the kind we used to have, and the option to decline installation of an advanced meter and retain a traditional meter. So I'm here. I want to have this happen. Um, I am a unable to sleep in my apartment. I am going to be either be sleeping in my car. I drive 30 minutes to sleep at my mom's now because I can't handle it anymore. It's making me literally sick, and I can't sleep. And I have migraines so bad, and I know this is what it's from. So okay. sorry to take too much time. All right. Well, I, I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Um, what I'd like us to do is I know you had some information that you thought we should see a video and whatnot. So if you could make sure that that's sent to our clerk so that she can share with all of us. And I'd like some kind of information about what the legal, uh, what the law that uh, Marnie just referred to. And, um, and, and we can look at that uh, on our- What's that statute number again? 4911? Uh, 4901 colon 1-10-05. And I did mention something to Mr. Burns, and um, I said, look, I'm willing to buy the analog meter. I want this put in because I can't be at my home. It's disrupting my life. Okay, so we and will. And I was told that you, I will not replace your meter, and if you replace your meter, I will shut your power off. And I just want you to know that this is a very serious issue, and it's been going along, on all around the world. Okay. And some whole cities have banned them because okay. they're so dangerous. So, Marnie, we, I, and sorry to cut you off, but we're now at, at over five minutes. Okay. Um, so we will review this, and we will uh, educate ourselves more and see what, what the options are. And that's great for the council, but I personally need this to happen ASAP, and if this is my legal right, I just need to know how to expedite this as soon as possible. Okay. Then talk to our village manager. Okay. Um, okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other citizen concerns? Yes. Yeah. Ken, what do you want? Um, this is really minutia due process issue. Brian, um, when you call the roll, uh, you'll ask for uh, all those in favor say aye, right? Mm -hmm. Is it not customary to, s to actually ask for an opposing nays? I know that you've not been doing that. Is that is there some policy or practice um, on that? I, it, I don't know that it's customary, but if there's any indication that everyone's not saying aye, then you certainly do that. Um, but you know what? I'm happy to do it. Thanks oh, for bringing oh, it up. Okay. okay. Also, on, on matters of uh, timing uh, for public input, um, I think it would be well if we would make uh, a little bit more precise use of the clock. So it's it's it's. Uh, Did you, were you here at the beginning when I said that we're going to get the clock fixed? Oh, okay. okay. Well, yeah, so, and that it be within view of the. Um, yes, that's we are ha going to have that clock fixed. It's going to have a beeping sound. And it will and be within view of the camera. 
Um, okay. That would be my other recommendation. Uh, if we can accommodate that, we will. Thank you. Uh, one last thing. Um, I noticed that in many gov city governments, uh, emergencies are declared as a way to uh, sort of bypass <coughs> due process issues of, of numbers of hearings, et cetera. I don't know what the policy is on that, but it is a sort of a circumventing of due process. And uh, not, so some other time, I'd like to hear from you uh, or, or any council member what the policy is on that so that the public can be heard. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other citizen concerns? Sean? So I just wanted to uh, say I am a member of the Yellow Springs Police Accountability Coalition. And as uh, a member, you know, we, I have tried to bring forward some concerns um, from the group. We're primarily a group of victims of police misconduct. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, disappointing that uh, we, we did contribute even in August, five, five months, not almost five months, we've contributed to the process of the uh, Justice System Commission. Um, uh, mentioning our, our um, <coughs> input, excuse me, and and uh, so it's it's disappointing that the, the concerns of a body that represents police misconduct was basically disregarded. I mean, I understand that there were you know deliberations brought to it, but I, I challenge uh, y'all to um, ensure that uh, these concerns do not manifest uh, of the of the police. Uh, presence at the, the meetings. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to invite uh, a res um, some sort of a, uh, understanding of where uh, the resolution regarding the New Year's Eve will, uh, will go, how, how, how that process will go. Certainly, I understand that the uh, police has declared that they will uh, have the event and uh, go on until one. I think that's great. I think this is all the more reason to seize on the, the moment when we have a, a chief of police which is willing to, to do and practice what we've been doing in practice. Uh, but let's, let's get that in a resolution and get that uh, codified so that we don't have um, a more uh, potential for breakdown like we had two years ago. Um, so uh, Finally, I want to invite uh, uh, the members of council that uh, spoke against my, my sharing last meeting uh, to address uh, the fact that I have been victimized by the council to, and to declare a commitment that I will not be victimized by any member of the council or uh, public official going forward. This is very serious. I was um, uh, in violation, I'm told, of the uh, guidance where we're supposed to only uh, address the um, president and then uh, get permission uh, to speak to anyone else from the president. Uh, apparently, that, that was, there was a lot of unclarity, not just on my part on that uh, particular passage of guidance, yet I, had, I was told to sit down. I was told to, uh, that, that, that we don't want to hear it. And I was told that, uh, and I was threatened to, ha to be removed, all just for one violation of code that is actually often violated uh, by people at just about every single council meeting. So I contend that, that I was only denied my three minutes, which most everyone else is, is allowed, because I was reporting uh, um, victimization and abuse. So that, that's ba that is victimization when uh, the three minutes is, is something allowed to, to everyone is being denied to somebody based on the fact that they're reporting abuse. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Any other citizen concerns? Okay. If not, we are moving into special reports. And we have Michael here from Tool Design Group. Uh, Tool Design Group uh, did our active transportation plan, which has been about a year long process. And uh, for the most part, I'm going to turn it over to Michael and I might say a few things uh, as you present. Sounds good. By the way, I also want to mention we have uh, not only Teresa Wise here from Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, um, who is overseeing Greene County, but also we have Devin Shoemaker, uh, who is now the Executive Director of Greene County Regional Planning. Glad you guys could both make it. So I take it there's no, no desire to respond to my request to deal with the fact that I was victimized? Sean. 
yeah, we are, we have moved on. So. Well, I have not moved on from that. I, I certainly don't want to be victimized in the future. That's why I'm bringing it forward because I feel it's an issue for the future. All right, so Sean, you're you're out of order, and so we are now on in special reports. Okay, that's fine. I feel that the the council was out of order last time, and I, I would like not to be victimized going forward. I really want there to be a line drawn around the victimization of the victim who had, was the victim of. All right, so Sean, I'm going to ask you one more time to please be silent. All right, and let us move on with our meeting. So we heard your concerns, and if anything will be addressed, that may be in a future meeting. Okay. All right, we ready? Okay. okay. Um, thank you, council members, for your time and attention uh, while I share our active transportation planning process and results with you over the past year. Uh, my name is Michael Blau. I'm a planner with Tool Design Group in their Columbus office. And I spent uh, quite a amount of time down here um, working with um, village government as well as community members to develop this plan. So I'm excited to share that with you. Uh, personal note, uh, my dad grew up here. And <laughs> his dad went uh, taught at Antioch. So although I was not involved in the whole planning process, those are my Yellow Springs credentials. And that was it. <laughs> So before we delve into the plan, I just wanted to give a brief overview of what active transportation actually refers to, just to make sure we all understand the language that I'm using. Um, active transportation is basically any form of travel without a motori motorized vehicle. So biking and walking are the primary forms. We also count transit, because most transit trips begin or end on foot or by bike. And then we also include uh, people in wheelchairs and with mobility devices under that umbrella. An important concept to remember as you're going through the plan is that it's not just recreational. It's not your weekend rider on the trail. It's people who are biking to their third shift at a fast food place. It's a student who's walking to school in the morning with her parents. Um, it's all types of trips and all types of ages and abilities. So we really want to clarify that when we're talking about active transportation, um, we want to be inclusive. And uh, in some, it's a healthy, sustainable, and practical way to make all of these trips and really improve quality of life in your community. So yeah, so I'm gonna jump in on this one. And uh, one of the things I wanted to remind everyone of is the active transportation goal that we established actually two years ago. Um, and uh, this highlights some of the reasons why we've made this one of our major eight goals, focusing on our safety, sustainability, and of course, we want to encourage active transportation because not only does it improve health, but it also, uh, improves our environmental uh, uh, conditions, and it also uh, is an economic development driver. And we've seen that with you know the fact that we're on the Little Miami Scenic Trail, which is part of the nation's largest paved trail network. Um, and then on the next slide, Judy, um, this just highlights some of the accomplishments that we made in 2017. Remember, we passed a complete streets policy thanks to the support of MVRPC. Uh, that was a great process. And Complete Streets recognizes that the streets are for everyone, all ages, all abilities. Uh, the other thing is we became a bike-friendly community in the spring, uh, bronze status, and a lot of feedback on how to continue improving both education and other things around that. Um, and the nice thing about getting this grant from ODOT and the Department of Health is that that covered the entire expense of this project. So no taxpayer dollars were spent on this. I want to thank our Yellow Springs Active Transportation Committee for uh, taking up this cause and securing this grant. We were one of six communities statewide that were awarded one of these grants, so it was pretty cool. And so that really accelerated a lot of what we're going to be able to do moving forward and you'll see some of the results that Michael's going to talk about in a minute. But um, you know, again, I, I think this is a great testament of if you set a clear goal with solid actions, you see results happening. And uh, it's been pretty cool. When you, excuse me. When you say no taxpayer dollars, you mean local taxpayer dollars, right? I mean, Actually, a, these come but, from federal funds. So the taxpayers pay. Yeah, right. Well, but no, you're right. Mean. So no lo, low local taxpayer dollars. So fair or minimal local 
<laughs> so yeah, right. Cents, a couple cents for each of us. All right. So thanks for that clarification, Marianne. All right. Um, did you want to talk about the next slide as well? Um, yeah. I mean, so I, I mentioned a little bit about where this funding came from, um, and uh, this was a one uh, one grant cycle that um, ODOT and ODH. Department of Transportation, Department of Health have an active transportation team, um, and this was something that they did, and, and hopefully they'll do in the future. They also supported some actual construction of projects as well. Um, and this highlights some of the folks that were involved in this process. Uh, we did have an advisory committee, so uh, you know the chamber was really involved, the schools were very engaged, one of our key projects involves them. Uh, the senior center, a very important player as well. And uh, if you look at the plan, we had about uh, 20 people on the advisory committee, including some of the state agencies, which ultimately have responsibility for funding. So it's good that they know what we're doing. Um, and in fact, I believe the county is now thinking about an active transportation and a plan. So it's nice to have Devin see the results of what we've done that we hope can you know, expand uh, region-wide. And I'll just add one more thing to this slide from ODOT's perspective and the project team perspective. Um, they were really emphasizing that they wanted this to be heavily public engagement based planning process. And we always strive to do that you know, on all of our plans. And I think this is a great example of really um, achieving that goal. We had five meetings, I believe, with the Active Transportation Committee. They were highly involved in directing the entire planning process from um, educating us about existing conditions to prioritizing our recommendations. So. They were a great partner, um, and I think ODOT really appreciates seeing that public involvement. We were also out in the community um, going to events. We went to the farmer's market, the street fair, um, opening day for trails, a number of other events to interact directly with the public, um, hear their concerns about active transportation and what they wanted to prioritize, and we hope that that's reflected in the plan. So I'll talk a little bit about existing conditions and then go into more detail with our recommendations. Um, Yellow Springs has a long history of active transportation related efforts, even though that term wasn't in use beforehand. Um, it's been part of the nation's largest paved trail network with over 340 miles of trails in the Dayton area and Miami Valley um, for decades. And so it's really ahead of the game when it comes to active transportation infrastructure on the ground. Unfortunately, um, because some of those facilities are so old, maintenance and disrepair was a major concern during the planning process. And we addressed those issues in our recommendations with uh, reconstructing some of the older facilities in Yellow Springs. Um, it's also not the first uh, active transportation related plan that Yellow Springs has conducted. Um, there have been a number of other plans. The map on the screen is from the sidewalk study of 2015, which really sought to understand the quality and quantity of sidewalks in the village and what their extent was. There was also, also a school travel plan conducted in 2011, um, focusing specifically on safe routes to school and how students are walking and biking around Yellow Springs. Um, so this is really building on those efforts. This isn't a standalone plan. Um, it's really to um, try to synthesize all of the data and issues from those previous plans and move forward with, with recommendations. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but just to point out that there are a number of existing programs that encourage and educate people about active transportation. Um, Yellow Springs is really active in that field. Uh, just a couple opening day for trails, like I said, is a, a huge event that attracts lots of visitors from all over the region. <coughs> um, also point out the Antioch Bike Co-op as a great low cost effective program of getting people to um, switch their mode to biking more often and using biking trips uh, within a particular community. So I'm not sure if you can make that out, but when we talk about active transportation, um, we have these five E categories. Um, the first E is engineering, but the other four are non-infrastructure. And those are education, encouragement, evaluation, and enforcement. So those are all of the activities that support the use of that infrastructure. You have to you know, educate people how to walk and bike safely and responsibly, um, have programs that encourage people to get out and walk and bike. So that's what those programs are about. Yellow Springs is doing a great job in the education and encouragement realm. Um, but you can see the columns on the, on the right-hand side are a little bit emptier. That's evaluation and enforcement. So we focused our recommendations on um, developing some evaluation and enforcement programs. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then expanding some of the education and encouragement programs. Um, 
one example of an evaluation program would just be conducting regular bicycle and pedestrian counts and student travel tallies. So you have a baseline of um, some bike and pedestrian data as you're moving forward. An example of an enforcement program uh, could be a pace car program. We have this in Columbus, and I think it would actually be even more effective here. Um, this is when you uh, recruit driver volunteers to put a sticker on their car saying that they drive the speed limit, they obey traffic regulations, they're courteous and responsible to bicyclists and pedestrians and other road users, and they're really setting the tone for a courteous atmosphere, a courteous travel atmosphere throughout the village. Mm -hmm. I think it would have an even greater impact in Yellow Springs because of their smaller size. They would be more visible. And in Columbus, I know we especially try to emphasize this around school locations. So that's something you could consider as well. Um, that falls under enforcement because the police would be involved in, in implementing and overseeing that program. Um, sorry, could you go back to the other one? Um, a couple of, that's okay. A couple of other examples under education and encouragement, uh, walking school buses or bike train um, this was brought up a few times as a great way to get kids to walk and bike to school more frequently. It could be anything from just ad hoc parent volunteers wanting to walk their kids to school once a week, or it could be highly organized with drop-off time, drop times and locations and uh, organized by the school district. So there are a number of ways you could go about doing that. And then bicycle parking. I wanted to throw this in there because that was a concern uh, that came up several times during the planning process in that there is a lack of bike parking in the downtown, the commercial area. And that's actually a great problem to have. That means people are taking bike trips. But if you don't have the facility to accommodate them at the end of their trips, that might discourage them from biking. Um, so this is an example from Dayton. You've probably seen those blue racks. Um, the Dayton Downtown Development Corporation partnered with a private company to install those racks. That's something that Yellow Springs could consider as well. So those were all of our non-infrastructure related recommendations um, related to those four E's. The fifth E is engineering. So that is your infrastructure recommendations and that's what we're going to talk about now. And that really constituted the, the bulk of our recommendations. You can go ahead, Judy, please. Thanks. So we divide our recommendations into two different categories, uh, regional and local. And we also divided them into linear recommendations. So that would be sidewalks, trails, um, as opposed to spot recommendations and spot improvements, like focusing on a particular intersection or a particular crossing. So you can see the um, ones that are circled in red are the four regional recommendations, and those are really meant to um, connect Yellow Springs to regional destinations like Clifton Gorge State Nature Preserve or Young's Jersey Dairy, which I might visit on the way home, <laughs> and also just to increase general connectivity um, to other communities throughout the region. And uh, local recommendations, a lot of them really focus on the downtown and the commercial area, although they are distributed throughout the village. Um, I zoomed in on this area just to show you um, the, the uh, density and volume of recommendations we have here. We're really, um, this is an ambitious plan. I think it's achievable, but we have a lot of recommendations in, in this area. Um, as you can see, the map tells you um, where are the neighborhood bikeways, where are the sidewalks, where are the different types of bicycle facilities. So you can look at the map and and see where those are. Um, the spot recommendations, which are the, the purple dots there, um, those are not called out as specific treatment. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that. For those spot recommendations, that includes a number of different treatments. Um, there are crossing improvements for the Little Miami Scenic Trail on Dayton and Xenia, um, making sure those crossings are more visible with signage and uh, flashing beacons. There are <coughs> intersection improvements with high visibility crosswalks. Um, curb extensions and things like that, which we'll talk a little bit more about. There are mid-block crossings, signage, pavement markings. Um, those recommendations are distributed throughout the, uh, the downtown area. And you can go to the next one. So this is an example, uh, just to delve, delve into a little more detail of one of those spot recommendations. Um, this is on Xenia Avenue at Corey Street. And during the planning process, um, that area was called out as a dangerous area for pedestrians because that intersection uh, the one in the, the bottom left corner is irregular. It has some skewed angles, which makes it um, even longer for pedestrians to cross. And those wide curb radii, those wide angles, also encourage fast turning movements, which means that drivers might be less likely to yield to crossing pedestrians. So uh, to remedy that, uh, next slide, please. We recommended adding high visibility crosswalks on every leg uh, just to define that space as a multimodal space where pedestrians are allowed to be. We also recommended adding curb extensions to 
um, tighten up those angles and slow drivers down as they're making those turning movements. So this is um, sort of a more detailed example of some of the spot recommendations that we developed. We did not have renderings uh, illustrating each recommendation, um, but that just gives you an idea of, of what we're talking about. We did have detailed um, text written up for each recommendation. As far as implementation and next Actually, steps. Actually, and I just want to yeah. mention, um, maybe it's good to explain what a bump out is, um, since oh, sure. that's talked about a lot in the plan. Yeah, so um, if you could go back to that rendering mm -hmm. image. So if you can tell uh, where those stop signs are on that intersection, there's also a lighter gray area that's jutting out into the intersection. Um, that's a curb extension or a bump out. And uh, the purpose of those is to shorten the pedestrian crossing distance. It's also to make pedestrians more visible as they're waiting on the curb to cross um, so that motors yield to them. And then, like I said, it's really, in this case, it's really meant to tighten up those angles and make that more of a regular right angled intersection, intersection to control traffic movements. So yeah, that's just one example of some of the traffic calming treatments that we recommended. Um, as far as implementation, I'll talk a little bit about this before I wrap up. So there were a number of um, priority projects that the Active Transportation Committee wanted to see underway fairly soon. Um, they really led the charge on this. They told us what they wanted to prioritize and what was important to them, and then we um, put that into the plan. And uh, with Ryan's direction, we also included all of the possible safe routes to school recommendations as priority one short-term recommendations to support Yellow Springs um, Safe Routes to School grant application, which is ongoing right now. So there are 13 priority projects total, including those Safe Routes to School ones. Um, that is a pretty ambitious number of projects to, uh, to delve into over the next few years. But just to clarify, um, that doesn't mean all those projects are going to be complete in a couple of years. That means that the village is committing to having the majority of those projects underway in a planning or design stage or some sort of preliminary uh, conceptual planning stage. So those projects will take longer than a couple of years to complete. Um, the plan just wants to see them underway uh, within a couple of years. Um, the implementation chapter also talks about potential funding sources. And I'm not going to delve into this too much. Um, it's still under development uh, in consultation with the village and other stakeholders. But we identified potential sources for every single project, every individual recommendation. And then we have descriptions of each of those um, at the federal and state level, as well as the local level. There's some innovative ideas in the plan, like a levy for active transportation or a public-private partnership with um, some local companies to improve uh, facilities in their areas. And then the final section implementation talks about performance measures. And it doesn't delve into too much detail. Um, it was beyond the scope of this plan to really develop a, a robust uh, performance measures program but the plan does include resources for you all to look at if you want to pursue that. And we do recommend that you develop and continue to follow some performance measures, such as the ones from the Complete Streets Policy, um, which really try to establish a baseline measurement for bike and pedestrian activity um, before you start making these improvements so you can see what type of effect they've had. So that's it for the plan. Um, it was a pretty high level overview, so if anyone has any other questions or comments, I'd be happy to answer those now. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just briefly talk about what's on the wall? I mean, I know sure. we looked at one of them, but. Yeah. Um, so this is the one that we just discussed at Xenia and Corey. Um, this one at Dayton and Winter is, is a fairly simple recommendation. It's just to make these crosswalks more visible. And then this is a raised crosswalk um, to slow traffic. So we typically don't, typically don't recommend those um, on, on very busy streets. But in this case, we really wanted to prioritize pedestrians along this route. Um, so there's a raised crosswalk on that leg. And then this one is right by Mills Lawn School, um, which is up over here. And the primary point of this recommendation is to uh, install a shared use path right here. So that would allow students safe access to the school campus um, from the surrounding neighborhoods. But it also makes a couple of other recommendations on Walnut Street uh, to calm traffic there, including adding um, angled parking and potentially some circulation changes. So all of that is really to improve the, um, the environment around the school as kids are walking and biking to school. Yeah. Can I ask you a question real quick? Um, Sorry. I just recall downtown, um, the main crossing near U.S. Bank, um, and that's a difficult one going back and forth. What do you feel about, uh, like, a flat 
flashing light or something, a cone or something in the middle just to alert individuals, people are crossing. You're, you're talking about here or downtown? And Michael, can you just, uh, um, for the folks that are listening, can yeah. you just kind of paraphrase the question before you answer? Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, so the question was, is there some sort of um, beacon or signage treatment that would improve that crossing? Right. And she's talking about at Short Street and Xenia is where she's talking about. At Short about. Street and Xenia. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what that recommendation was, but I do know that in several spots throughout downtown, like at the trail crossings, um, we are recommending rectangular rapid flashing beacons okay. uh, to improve visibility, mm -hmm. right. as well as signage, high visibility crosswalks, that, that type of thing. So for that particular location, I'd have to consult the plan, but I know that we are considering those treatments elsewhere too. Yeah, that, it, that is what we talked about when that we walked too. that part because okay. I was on the team that went down that side. Okay. Top crosswalks. Um, we picked things like that that we thought, you know, those treatments might apply to other areas. Um, so, you know, it could be a way to slow down traffic at the Emporium and Tom's, for example. Um, so we wanted to get the most bang for our buck because part of the project was the three renderings that would set us up for applying for grants. Okay. I think it was an alternative treatment for this leg of the intersection at Xenia and Corey too, to right. have a raised crosswalk there as a sort of a gateway treatment into that area. Yeah, yeah I have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, three questions, I guess. One is about Fairfield Road, which there's a pretty vehicles travel pretty fast on Fairfield uh, and there is no sidewalk on part of Fairfield so I was wondering what might be done about that that's one question another question was I've seen places where instead of using white strips they use multicolored strips and I'm wondering is that something that is legal to do I'll just do those two questions okay. did we did ask ODOT about the rainbow and they they won't let us do that on on uh, Xenia because it's a state route. But we could do it on, like. That's, that's the short answer. For locally maintained and owned roads, um, you can do those, those types so of treatments. So Dayton Street is okay and Fairfield is okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But for, for any changes on a US or a state route or an ODOT maintained road, you would have to get their permission for that. So about Fairfield, right, was there anything so for Fairfield, I'm looking at the, um, the regional recommendations map, if you wanted to go back to that. Um, there is a sidewalk recommendation there that would connect um, the northern part of the village uh, along Polecat to the Little Miami, Miami Scenic Trail, and that also um, extends on Fairfield Road east and west, but it doesn't go very far. It's just sort of jutting out from that intersection. I guess maybe it was the Safe Routes to School that suggested taking it sidewalk to Ridgecrest. It, it, this well, the Safe Routes to School project that we just finished last year goes from the Fair Acres entrance down to Winter Street, and down, right. then down Winter to Pleasant, and meets right. up with the sidewalk there. Um, I don't think the Safe Routes to School I project I I read recommended it going north on Polecat. Dan might know he was part of that. No, I it I didn't. Read that. The recommendations of Jones. Uh, actually, I thought the sidewalk. Well, the village is going to, ODOT didn't want to finish that part because there are drainage and engineering issues. So the village committed to doing that and we're having the engineering done so we can get it from Fair Acres to Stafford. But yeah, it was not included in the funding for, that we got for Safe Routes to School. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Lisa? Uh, this may be a little off topic. First of all, what a tremendous report. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive and informative. Um, I'm just wondering how this all fits in with the capacity of all the other projects the village has going on, because these projects seem great and important and add to safety and the quality of life, but as you said, it's more projects. So I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, I mean, so I'll answer that by saying, you know, this, having an active transportation plan will I think make us a lot more successful at applying for safe routes to school funding, for example. Mm -hmm. And while the village would, you know, be overseeing those projects, those would be contracted out. You know, so just like with mm -hmm. the the first part of the safe routes to school that took Fairfield to Winter to get to Mills Lawn, um, you know, all of the uh, right of way acquisition and all of that, that's all part of the funding. Um, 
So, so yes, our, our, you know, our crew would have to oversee the, you know, mm -hmm. higher level, but we would be looking at funding. Thanks for that clarification. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Kevin? Well, yes, yeah, excuse me just a minute. So at first when I was looking at the map that's Dayton Street and Winter Street, and you mentioned, uh, Michael, the raised crosswalk, I was going to ask the question, wow, do you want to really want to do that on a state route? But that's not where you were. <laughs> but then uh, you did mention, I think just as you were walking away from Corey and Xenia Avenue, that you, when you mentioned a potential raised crosswalk there, is that crossing Xenia? Um, and does the state care about that? Or am I, did I misunderstand? So I think that one is actually talking about the southern leg of the intersection. Is that, is that right? So that's not actually crossing Xenia, it's parallel to Xenia? Okay. okay. Right? Yeah. All right. And that's actually, that was an alternative, so um, it was mentioned as a, a potential recommendation, but it's not the, the main improvement for that intersection. Thank you. Uh, Dan? There are implications for a raised uh, crosswalk. Uh, what about when it gets icy and snows? You've got plows going mm -hmm. askew. Mm -hmm. Also, if they're not drained properly, it, it can become a slippery. So it might seem like a good idea, but it may also be quite situational. What do you think is a good idea? I will say that maintenance is definitely an important consideration when you're putting one, uh, one of these in and we always encourage clients to to have maintenance written into the plan ahead of time so that they uh, know what's coming so for example like making sure that you salt and de-ice those specific locations as as priority locations and the sidewalks around those could be a, a potential solution making sure you have plows and other equipment that can um, navigate over them without damaging the plow or damaging the, the crosswalk is, is a good idea, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ken? Uh, I think this plan is awesome. Uh, Should he, does he need a microphone? <coughs> yeah, Michael, you want to facilitate? <laughs> I just, I think it's great. Uh, I, I, I agree with, with uh, uh, Brian that it, it's only through planning like this that we can be ready for the, the grant money that it comes through, uh, that becomes available. Uh, this is really uh, a wonderfully detailed plan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess it, there was one more point. The, the, how far out are we looking? Um, uh, it's been an idea in my mind a, a quite a long time that uh, perhaps Yellow Springs could uh, do a parking structure perhaps on this, uh, where this park is that no one goes. Uh, I might add that the park isn't used perhaps because it hasn't been developed by a park, as a park, uh, but I think we ought to be looking even further down the road, uh, uh, like some of the great cities of, uh, like Burlington, uh, uh, Vermont, which has done a parking structure. I would encourage you to do more of this and look further. Yeah, what I can say about that is um, w we've talked about parking uh, a couple meetings, and uh, right now, Patty and Johnny are doing some research about some possibilities that will be discussed by council. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's very important. I, and I know Kevin's also said this, think that uh, paid parking is something that we also need to explore to help develop our community and support some of these projects. Okay. Paid parking can also be a great incentive for more walking and biking too. <laughs> exactly, yes. Uh, uh -huh. so, <laughs> so, so lest that become an inflammatory statement, Yes. Um, I want to clarify what I'm making up in my head that you're talking about paid parking for people who don't live in the community or on a per particular street, not paid parking for community members. So, uh, yeah, not to get uh, into the weeds yet, but um, the systems that we're looking at can accommodate different users and can distinguish between, you know, residents versus visitors. So, yep. Good Thanks point. for clarifying. Yep. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, Michael, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Appreciate and I uh, commend all of you as well because it was really a team effort. So we, we definitely appreciate the collaboration from you all and other stakeholders as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I know Brian, we'll be in to touch to, uh, or, yeah, you can put that back. Did you want me to stick around for the, start my drive home? Yeah. <laughs> go, go to Young's. Yeah, go to Young's. <laughs> Probably open for another hour. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I think they're so yeah. nice. Yeah. Still got some time. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank All right. Thank All right.
Um, all right, we're going to move into old business, and the first item on old business is uh, the village manager search. And um, what I hope we can mainly focus on is what's in the packet is the prior profile statement and community description, and then a proposed copy for the new uh, uh, position description. Um, we are going to have it graphically designed, so uh, we've already set that piece up. So unless anybody is really concerned about the pictures, we decided that uh, between Karen Wintrow and, and Patty that they could probably handle that part, but we will get to see that. Um, so I thought our discussion should primarily focus on any thoughts about the description, things that should be adjusted, added, um, et cetera. I had a couple of tweaking kind of things. Okay. Things you that you want to discuss or just pass well, along? Well, well, mostly I, a couple of them I could pass along. I mean, I could just pass along all of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I, I guess if it's if it's not if it's not substan substantive, uh, you can send the comments to me and I'll make sure that they get incorporated. Well, um, I'll just say one question. What does it mean by our team, with a capital T? Um, uh, that is the village team. What's the village team? Uh, council, uh, all of our departments, et cetera. Well, I'll, I'll make some okay. suggested comment, cha word changes. Okay. Kevin? And the, the one piece in here that was primarily put together by management partners we're we just going to redo that, or do we have permission to take that and so some of the things? Um, I mean, I, I think we will end up probably with four pages again um, because you see three pages of copy plus there'll be pictures. Um, one thing that's not reflected here, uh, but it was well, it's in the parenthetical, is yeah. pop outs of our goals and values. Mm -hmm. um, that was a thought that Lisa had, and, and I think that's a really good one. Because I think that really shows, you know, what we're doing and what you're getting into. Um, and the other thing about photos is we wanted to make sure that the um, village team member related photos were updated uh, to reflect who is currently working with the village, and also to uh, pictures reflecting more diversity. Um, if you look at some of those pictures, they I don't think show the full diverse the diversity of the village. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Lisa? Yeah, I just think another thing that we really tried to do was hone in on um, on the um, ideal skill set and reduce needless words and have it be more bulleted. So that's why you'll see on page, oh gee, it's not numbered, I guess it's the second, third, the third, third page. page of the mock-up, yeah. rather than like a paragraph that goes on and on, there's just these words that are bulleted rather than paragraph text. <coughs> the, the Messiah we're looking for. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, Keep it simple. Um, if you look at those <laughs> descriptions, it, every, yeah. it seems like every <laughs> municipality is looking for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, Patty? I, I'd like to suggest that you put a salary range on there instead of saying salary up to, because I think most people, when you're looking for a job and you see salary up to the 125, then they're assuming that they're going to get somewhere really close to that, and you know, 120 or 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 you know, 125, and that you may not get that person. You may get somebody for 115, and I think that you may want to consider putting a range on there. Okay. It, the, the last year time did I think it was 85,000 to 100. Or uh, I think it is 85 to 115. 115, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen it done both ways, but I think that's that's fine mm -hmm. with, with me. Can, so Because if you get a person who has a, a master's like I do, you may want to pay them one thing, but if they have a master's and they're a certified planner, you might want to pay them a little bit more because of the you know economic development benefit that comes with it or something like that. Okay. So... Uh, what do we want to make the low end of the range then? Well, do you want to bump it up? Ten thousand. I mean, 
Do you want to say 85 or? Yeah, 85. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I will just to give you an example. So Springfield, you know, recently, uh, I mean, they, they are in a hiring process. Theirs was, they did an up to 150. Um, I mean, again, I, you know, my goal isn't to pay the high end, but I do think uh, based on some of the expectations that I think we've talked about, if we do really get that phenomenal person, um, you know, we may need to think about a uh, higher salary, so. Higher than 125? No. Oh. <laughs> well, we might get some great young person who we think has all these qualities, but they ha don't have a lot of experience. Right. So well, and then, you know, then we, as long as they're going to stay work. around for four years. All right. Um, any other comments? Um, okay, so we've got two ways that we can go here. Um, in the timeline that we brought forward at the last meeting, we suggested that we would get this done next week and put it out. So I guess my question is, does council want to see the final product or are they comfortable enough? Are you comfortable enough with the feedback and that document going out next week? That job posting going out next week? I'd like to see the final, but it doesn't, in my opinion, have to be at a council meeting. Okay. I can see it in the interim and express any concerns. Okay. I mean, I think part of the reason why we, it'd be nice to get it out next week is we're starting to rush up on the holidays. And so, um, I mean, if, if substantively we feel pretty good about this, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll share it uh, and have people review it um, for editing and so forth. But, uh, but I'd like to get the notice out. And I think, Lisa, you want to talk a little bit about some of the things we're thinking about for posting? Yeah, so uh, uh, we're also thinking a lot about recruitment and posting strategy. I mean, there are some of the really obvious places to post, like professional organizations. Um, we're also um, really going to be leveraging the social network of the council and of our community. So, for example, and this is a this is really a uh, call out. This is going to be a call out to community members because we have a lot of people in Yellow Springs who know a lot of people and who live other places who know a lot of people who are smart and maybe wonderful and might really love to look into this opportunity. So we're really going to be asking for this kind of a snowballing circulation of this post. Send it to the people you know and ask them to send it to the people they know. That's going to be a really important strategy to get out of just a regional posting. Um, I also had a conversation today. I, I use LinkedIn a lot for my professional networking, um, but I also spoke with uh, LinkedIn about their ways that they assist with uh, professional recruiting. So um, they have two ways that they assist with uh, recruiting, and one is for a monthly fee for entities that are recruiting a lot of employees. So that's not for us. But they do have um, a, a mechanism that's um, self-directed. So for example, I could do it, anybody could do it, you fill it out, and it's about $100. And then what they do is they match it to keywords for the entire LinkedIn membership, and they, they point your posting at those people. So I want to find out a little bit more about that because I've started creating some sample searches um, to try to identify keywords that maybe have the best matches and then we'll want to make certain that those keywords are definitely in our position description mm -hmm. so that that all matches up. So I've started working on that and you know if we're on this timeline we're discussing we should be fine for that. So those are the two things mm -hmm. in the past couple of weeks that I've been focusing on as far as getting the word out. Um, and then just a that, that reminded me just to talk about cost, because remember last time we talked about figuring out the things we really needed. Um, for the graphic design and putting this together, we're, we were quoted four to 500. Lisa just mentioned a uh, hundred for recruiting. Does ICMA charge us anything? Or? Yes, they do. Okay, but 
I mean, I feel like we are looking at a much lower cost oh, than yeah. the 10,000 plus yeah. that we would be paying <laughs> a consultant. Um, and I think we'll get a lot better results. Um, the other thing is, uh, I know Ruth Ann and others have been thinking about um, the diversity piece. And so she's made some recommendations about where to post. And uh, so people are actively looking at this. And, and to Lisa's point, you know, it takes a village. So the more ideas we have and the more sharing of the post and everything, uh, the better. And so we welcome all kinds of thoughts about how we can get the word out uh, broadly. So will you send council members the post so we can pass it on? Or how will we? I think we have that? to get the application built. And then once we get it loaded in, yes. But it's going to be posted a lot of different places. So I think we need to decide which post we should share to circulate. Maybe it is the LinkedIn one. That would make sense, but not everyone's a LinkedIn user, so no, there's probably going to be a, a link to something at the village, right? Yeah, we'll yeah, have it on the website yeah, or Facebook I, page. Yeah, so the short answer is yes, you'll yeah. have a link to share. Yeah, normally, you post a smaller, a smaller, more condensed version, and then it says full full position description can be found at, and then it links to the village website. Right. I guess one other concern that I have is our LinkedIn page for the Village of Yellow Springs is very rudimentary. That's a polite way of saying it's like basically it exists, but it's very. I'm, I'm going to be absolutely honest with you and say I didn't know that we had one. So well, we do. Well, there it has like four followers. They're probably all sitting up here. <laughs> so I think that would be a, a something that we should try to tune that up before we uh, start recruiting on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. cool. And I, I'd like to help with that. Yeah, you know, that's great. I, think I've got I mean, a lot of the stuff LinkedIn. that you've done with Facebook, I think, can be used, and okay. photographs and things like that shouldn't take very long. Right. One thing before I forget, Judy, we need to make sure that our full goals uh, document is easy to find, because we do want to point. The pop-out will just have the, uh, the eight kind of general goals, but we want to make sure people can see all the action steps and everything as well. Mary? So who's working on this now? It seems like the two of you. Brian and I. Yeah, that was the task that we mm -hmm. said we'd do. Okay, and then staff, various staff people are doing various pieces. So do you need help from the other council members at this point? Not for this part, but um, what I will make sure we have in the next packet um, is, because it also says here, updated timeline. So remember we had the other document about the separating the different tasks and which council members were involved. You know, I know you and Kevin worked on the transition piece, and there were some other pieces like the citizen committee, so we need to put a call out for that. So at our next meeting, that general timeline that I showed before will be fleshed out. Yes. I don't think it would hurt to start thinking about the community, yes. how, to, how to do community involvement and the community committee members. Right. Just not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but we will. Uh, and we've got some really good models about what we did the last time, too, mm -hmm. uh, that we can uh, duplicate. Anything else? Okay, so we added one other old business item, which was Kevin giving an implicit bias update. Well, I will be quick. <clears throat> so we did the report out a few months ago about the training, uh, the implicit bias training that we did in August, I believe. Um, Based on the, the way that contract was written, uh, we expected that there should be some follow-on, uh, you know, to those uh, two meetings that we had. Um, uh, Patty and I uh, have spoken with the consultants, and we've come to a, an agreement about um, a common expectation for what uh, we can anticipate going forward. So in January, there will be uh, two additional uh, sessions um, involving staff, uh, village staff, and the consultants. Uh, the first one will be on the 17th. I think these are both Wednesdays. 
uh, but the 17th of January and then the 24th of J I'm looking at this date on here. But anyway, but the 24th of January. Um, and the first one will just be um, the leadership, uh, supervisors uh, in the village, uh, you know, Patty and her direct reports and, and a couple of other folks. <clears throat> And that will be close to almost like a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, relationship, if you will, between the consultants and the leadership, uh, looking at uh, how effective the first couple of rounds of training were, uh, how and to what degree if those leaders are implementing uh, some of the things that they learned from the first uh, round of training, you know, in their day-to-day -day interactions with their team members. Um, and then the second uh, week or the second session will be the rest of staff and I'm not sure and Pat you should speak to whether I don't know if it's been determined yet whether the leadership will be involved with that I think we yes, said yes. yes okay they would all be because I think the, there was some negotiation about whether we were going to do it separately but I think we did agree right right um, but not council right right none of this involves council this is again just strictly staff um, so, if, uh, and I didn't, uh, we didn't go into a lot of details about, again, the phases one, two, and three, uh, but it was my and Patty's uh, understanding that this was the third phase of the training, that we, we expected to do something like this all along, you know, but it was a minor misunderstanding, so, there w so we will incur uh, some small expense uh, for this additional training. And, 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 and as we went back and understood the contract the way it was written, this is, it is appropriate. Uh, we just were hope, hopeful that we wouldn't have to spend any more money. What do we mean by a small expense? Um, $3,200. Okay. Which is about half? Uh, well, it, was, it was, I think, 8000 last year. Yeah, so because a little less. four sessions of. Right, so this is less than half the, of what we, what we spent before. Um, so again, in, in, the, in the spirit of, of you know, re really trying to look at you know, what implicit bias means and what our, um, you know, the baggage that we all bring uh, with us, um, it's a matter of really just trying to, to really equip, especially the leadership, but also you know, the, the entire staff, to really take this serious and, and bring about a cultural change, um, and not just think of it as a one and done. Um, and to the degree that we want to do this, uh, for, uh, again, as a, from a cultural perspective, we talked about diversity hiring practices a little while ago. So we just wanted this to be part of that whole continuum of really uh, presenting on a, on a continual basis um, that we want to do something to make a difference. We talked a great deal about infrastructure uh, from a physical perspective. We also want to think about it maybe infrastructure from a uh, personal perspective, you know, making us better folks, as it were. And, and, and half of that cost would come out of this year's budget and half out of next year's. Okay, do we, and do we have a detailed proposal about what these sessions are going to be? Kevin has. Okay, can, yep. we have, can we have those in the packet for next time? Yep, you can. Okay. And, and Patty, what I was, what, what I paused at was the dates, the way the dates were written on their contract for the mm -hmm. second, for the second day. So we don't have these in email or in the packet? No. This is just new? Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Pay. So I guess what I'd like to see is actually what their plan is okay. for those two sessions. Okay. Um, you know, uh, training you know, out session outline. Right. Um, Pat, do you see the date that I'm referring to? The, the... Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I I professional mm -hmm. development is very important, so I certainly support that. Um, and I just want to make sure in that those session outlines, the goals are articulated. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Okay. Um, all right, we're into new business, and uh, Kevin, I'm going to let you kick off um, what we've been talking about for a uh, new approach to evaluations. Okay. Uh, last week, Brian and I met uh, to talk about some of the tools that were used in the past to do uh, performance evaluation or personnel evaluations um, for various folks throughout the village. Uh, we, are co of course, are focusing on the folks that that we are responsible for, uh, primarily Patty, Judy, and now 
maybe Judy's assistant, but that's no. no. Okay. No. Okay. No. All right. All right. Fine. So. Well, no. What we said was that um, we want Judy's assistant to be part of the 360 to evaluate her. Oh. Got so. It. Yeah. Yeah. So so it'd be you know so and then Patty and I had a discussion also about really how comprehensive this thing would be. So what. Um, as a result of those conversations, I, you know, Brian and I again, Brian and I again talked, and we combined a little bit of information from a couple of different tools. Each of you, I'm sure, have gotten the emails over on, on council at least, um, and Judy as well. Have gotten the emails over the last couple of days, uh, warning you that you would get uh, contacts from a, a person that you might not recognize will be done. Um, <laughs> The fact of the matter is, I mean, I tried to do, keep it simple. I had an account created uh, called, you know, SurveyMonkey at village.yellowstreams, et cetera. But SurveyMonkey wouldn't let me create an account called SurveyMonkey. So I had to give it a different name. So will be done is, is, is what that's uh, account called. So in addition to creating those accounts, we also uh, created a, a draft uh, uh, evaluation survey instrument that each of you all did receive in an email just before council, probably about 6 o'clock this evening. So I'd like for each of you on council, and, I think, and Judy, you got it as well, um, to take a look at it, go through the survey, give me your comments. You all also were sent over the weekend the credentials for the account, uh, both for the email account and for the SurveyMonkey account. Um, everyone here, uh, Patty included, got the credentials for the email and for the SurveyMonkey account. So um, this is just a draft uh, looking at uh, the p possibility of, of getting away from paper because getting away, what, what paper does, what, or uh, the problem I have with paper, is that you can, tra you can have the information in front of you, but it's, it's a lot of extra effort to sort of combine that into a report or, or um, you know, download into any kind of uh, statistical format, you know, but um, using SurveyMonkey right now, it, it, just picking that amongst all the other uh, potential tools, um, and we just have a free account right now. We can talk in the next few months about whether we want to spend the money, uh, you know, for, uh, for an account if we're going to continue to do this kind of thing, but it's free right now. So that, that does limit what we can do in terms of downloading and reports, but you can always do everything online right now. So we just want to go through it once uh, and see what it looks like. So right now, and Brian, did you get a chance to look at it the second time? Not yet. Okay. It, well, you'll find something interesting on that very first page. But uh, effectively, it's a drop down, and it lists the people that you, can use, that you are going to be evaluating, and it lists Patty, uh, Judy, and Eleanor. Uh, because one of us up here would also be evaluating Eleanor, I presume. No. Okay. <laughs> all right. That, it's okay. It's okay. It's all draft. Well, one of us up here is, oh. does, <laughs> there are seven of us. So quit saying oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, Brian. It would be me, yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's okay. But I think, I mean, the point being that, you know, what we said was that council would take the, take the lead and should take the lead on improving our evaluation process village-wide. We need to be more consistent mm -hmm. and we also need to be thinking about professional development. Um, one of the things that uh, Kevin pointed out that I thought was really good about the current evaluations or the past ones we've been using is they're very static. Mm -hmm. So every time we do Judy's, it's the exact same thing. Rank her one to five on filing and faxing. Rank her one to five on, you know, whatever, getting the minutes done. That is not, you know, promoting any kind of like goals or growth or anything like that. So there's this substantive change that um, I think we need to think about, you know, organization wide. So staff has been working really hard on revamping right. the so evaluations for, for all of the different departments coming up with specific criteria for each department. Right. So and they do need to be customized for right. different levels of the organization. Right, which is what we're trying to do. Right, so. but we should combine these efforts, and I think two things that make sense. One is doing something online, all right, can preserve anonymity and can also facilitate, you know, for you, for example, right? There are, I think I listed them out, maybe 10 
direct reports, you know, that might evaluate you, including counsel. For Judy, you know, we've talked about the different folks that she works with. So we've got to refine that piece for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is this sheet, if you want to just pull that out that's mm -hmm. on the table, um, would be a way to do our review after all that feedback is compiled. And, you know, again, we have a system that just averages the numbers, takes the comments together. No one has to worry about if, you know, if they were handwriting it, that somebody's going to read their handwriting or whatever. And um, what I think we should look at moving forward is there are goals that are set, and they're not goals about filing and faxing or whatever, all right? They're actual goals that, you know, promote professional development. Um, we need to agree on what the values and behaviors we want are. Um, this one is taken from another organization that I will not mention. So we need to tweak that part. And Kevin's been working on that and we'll want feedback on it. But then the idea would be we would sit down, in counsel's case, two of us would sit down with Judy and Patty. We'd review this part. And then we would, at that time, also talk about setting new goals for the following year. And so I think this kind of format is what I mean about organization-wide. This would be a way to promote that development so that we've got personal growth goals and it's not just evaluating the same thing every time. But it would need to be customized. And so I guess that's what you know, I'd like you to reflect, Patty, on you know, this activity and think about how it could work for the organization as a whole. Okay. I mean, not right now. This just, activity. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, yes. So, still some work to be done on it, um, but that's the general idea. Marianne, did you have a comment? Nope. Okay. Um, so, any other questions or comments at this point? Okay. So, what I will propose is that Kevin and I need to do a little bit more work on this. Mm -hmm. We will bring it back on the 17th uh, to get some final feedback, and that can still put us on target to finish this process by the end of the year, because once we have it on SurveyMonkey, it's gonna be relatively straightforward to do. We'll be able to average, do all that, and then we can work out the kinks as we go. Um, but I do think we need some kind of consistency beyond you know, just what council's doing. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Yeah, and, and, and that's what we're trying to do is that there, for instance, the police department is developing one for police officers, one for supervisors. I'm developing one for professionals and one for administrative. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I would, again, I think we can have a, a, a more serious conversation down the road about whether we spend just a little bit of money to get um, you know, a, 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 an upgraded package uh, beyond just the free package. But in the meantime, if it makes sense, if it's helpful at all, you know, I'd be willing to work with you, Patty, and your the rest of your team. But if we end up wanting to do this, I, I know there's some concern about whether folks would go to a computer because uh, everybody does have a, does not have a computer at their desk. Um, but I think for the, certainly for the first couple rounds, you know, everyone does. Everyone that we're considering doing this on does have a desk uh, or, and a computer at the desk. So we can, again, that's maybe just another cultural change that we'll talk about where the expectation is for us to use, you know, you don't need a desk, a computer at your desk to just spend 10 minutes once a year to go sit at a computer and go through this process, begin this process. But again, down the road, we can talk about that. Okay? I have a question. I, I don't recall that council has ever been involved in, certainly not in evaluating your direct reports. I don't recall that council has ever gotten feedback about performance evaluations of your direct reports. Probably not. And I guess I'd like to suggest that we might have a role in that. In what, what in, kind of in role? The, in, uh, 
seeing what your evaluation is of your direct report. I mean, what, 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 um, what you're wanting from them and what you're getting back from them. How about if you and I talk about that okay. privately? Okay. Okay. Um, so that's a good start. More to come next meeting. Um, we have a couple other new business items. All right, so let's talk about the Safe Routes to School travel plan that's teeing up the application. Um, Patty, why don't you talk about that one? Okay, so um, Brian and Chris Bongiorno and I have been meeting for a while now uh, with input from other members of the active transportation team as well as some uh, members from the previous uh, school travel plan committee to try to update the Safe Routes to School travel plan which is necessary for us to be able to apply for a Safe Routes to School grant when the uh, cycle opens in January. Um, and so we've been working on the update. Um, we're really pushing to get it done because I have to send it to ODOT to have them um, basically approve the plan. What you see in your packets tonight is a draft. There's still some, a couple of tweaks to be done. Uh, for instance, um, I got an email today that there was a typo in the demographics and I we fixed that. Um, there are still, uh, Brian and I were talking earlier uh, about updating the project list, things like that, to include some of the new projects you've heard about um, with the active transportation plan. But I need a voice vote from council so that Judy can write me a letter that says council took a voice vote to approve the plan as it's, it, it substantially stands now. I mean, this thing is really close to being done. We've upgrade, updated some of the pictures, the demographics, the bus schedules, everything. So it's just some basic tweaking now that needs to be done. So what I'm asking council for is a voice vote of endorsement on the draft plan that is in your packet um, so that we can finish it up and get it off to ODOT. I move that we vote on that. I second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> All right. I'm, I do have a question. No. Look under the counter. Yes, anyone else, <laughs> anyone else <laughs> down there? <laughs> <laughs> Judith, are you there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Mary. I, I did find the reference to uh, the sidewalk uh, on uh, Fairfield. Mm -hmm. It came apparently from one of the public meetings that, where it's listed uh, suggestions and ideas that there be a complete sidewalk on Fairfield mm -hmm. from Ridgecrest to Polecat, which I do think okay. is a good So that's, idea. In, that's in the list of projects? No, it, it's on the, well, it's the second. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the section it's, I worked on based okay. on the community meetings. Yeah. Okay. So, Mike. So you added that in? Yeah. This just now, though. Yeah. Okay. It actually it might have been on the prior one, but okay. I carried it over because um, we haven't done that yet. Okay. So anyway, I do think that that is needed. It's not in the short term or mid term plans. Is that right? But is there a long term or is? Well, there's an extensive list of projects, and the, the, those are all long. I mean, there are this trying to accomplish all of these will go out for a long time. Sure. Um, the grant that we hope to apply for in January is one that will take a sidewalk from Dayton Street to Mills Lawn along Limestone Street for the entire length, and it's a huge project, massive. Dayton uh, down Limestone to the school. So, you know, we've talked a lot about how dangerous limestone is right now because the sidewalk's not yeah, completed. No limestone. So that's that's the one we're complete. Oh, okay, okay. So with these plan uh, with these uh, applications, you put in a lot of stuff, but then you sort of target based on the money they give you the project. And the plan has to be updated every five years anyway. Okay. So. Um, you know, this, the, the grant that we apply for this January, the money will not become available until I think it's the 2021-22 cycle. So by that time, you know, you'll get that grant and be working with that and then have to update yeah. the travel plan for mm -hmm. the next cycle. Right. So. But the good news is now we're in the cycle because, right. you know, when we came on the council, 
we had this safe routes to school project that had languished right. forever and right. so melissa took that under control and now we're back on track and mm -hmm. this is a great revenue source which does not require any matching so from local taxpayers it does not require anything <laughs> from local taxpayers or so statewide taxpayers <laughs> oh yeah it does require yeah. statewide taxpayer money. <laughs> all right um okay so next up uh kevin wanted to talk about the commission budget so if everyone could refer to the little report that uh colleen did that shows on the right hand side um it's a landscape page. Um, everyone on council, let me know when you have it, please. Okay. You can just look at this one yeah, if you want. Yeah. Okay. We can share. Okay. <coughs> okay. So if you look along the right-hand side, um, you see what money is remaining on, on that blue line, uh, the money remaining in the budgets of each board or commission. Um, last month, uh, HRC received a request um, greater than the amount that's remaining in HRC, the $1,965. A single request? Yes. The request that comes through every year. It's for the eighth grade field trip. Hmm. I don't know about this. I don't so, know about every year, so. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, I'm, it's my first year on council, okay. so it's new to me, too. So every year they've asked for it. Um, last month when they asked, I said no, uh, because I was, at, we didn't even have that much. Uh, we had almost $1,000 less than what we currently have. So, um, you know, the district has routinely, as I understand it, routinely asked mm -hmm. for this money and routinely, routinely accepted uh, or, or received it. Uh, I am good with allowing them uh, to receive the grant, but we don't have that much money. So. And, and so just to give some history. Mm -hmm. That would be helpful. When that started, uh, I was the HRC liaison. It was, um, there was a remaining amount in the HRC budget. And so the idea came up that this would be a great thing to do to spend the rest of the HRC's budget. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that is how that began. Um, and, and it really was, you know, the idea that these funds were appropriated if they're not used within that year then they're going to go back into the general mm -hmm. fund um so i just want to give that background right. <clears throat> right do we know if they've also applied for a grant from the community foundation i don't know for sure um i'm, I'm we're supposed to have a full report of that this week yeah, I, I don't know if that is their common practice or not, Lisa. They, I don't remember that having been mentioned in the past years. Um, that doesn't mean that they haven't applied for those funds as well. They do look for different funding sources, and I know that the students have to raise some of the money on their own. And so um, it actually has changed a little bit for over the time that I've been here. Um, as Brian said, when it started, it was what was remaining. Then it became a set amount. Then it went back to simply what was still needed for the students to get them there that they weren't able to raise themselves. So it's kind of changed a little bit over time to be a, a different set of parameters, um, I guess, each time. But it all still goes to the trip. Is this for next year or this yeah. year? I mean, whenever the next eighth grade field trip, which is like in a few weeks March. for DC, it's March. March. Well, and I will say this is the first year they've actually set these parameters that say if your child is on free or reduced lunch, if they're on free lunch, this amount, if they're on reduced lunch, this amount, if they're on, so mm -hmm. that they've actually set kind of a, a standard for which kids are eligible for kind of receiving those funds. And in the past, it was just, if you need it, let us know. There wasn't a kind of a guideline as to which kids were eligible for how much. Um, so they have, I, it seems to me they're trying to tighten that piece up a little bit. So are you asking for reallocation of funds to cover the grant? What are you asking? Yes, in short, I'm asking for a reallocation, but not just to cover the grant. Um, you know, I was hesitant to, to speak about this publicly because we're going to have our meeting in three days. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to, I'm not asking for a carte blanche. Um, but uh, for some, if there's someone and I uh, 
I'll check here while I'm speaking <laughs> to see if another request has come in. But I don't want to promise the district the remaining balances in the HRC line and then not be able to address a need that might <clears throat> be presented to us on Thursday. Yep, I said it. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so. Well, they want it for 2019, correct? Yeah. So, so I mean, it seems like there are a couple options. One mm -hmm. is that you could take it out of your 2019 budget. The other is it looks like there's still 13,000 available in the, in the total 25,000. Right, so which art, is what I'm asking. Art and culture, that money is going to be spoken for. So that 699.78. dollars yeah. Um, can I can I make a recommendation that um, a more specific case is made? Because um, I think Lisa's question is important. What other funding sources are they looking at? Mm -hmm. I remember it was very important to me the first year we did this that it was really clear that we were, um, I guess, meeting a gap that couldn't be met otherwise. You know? mm -hmm. So students that wouldn't be able to go on the trip we're going to get to go because of our support. Um, and especially, I guess I get a little bit worried about, um, you know, moving forward, you know, we're talking about potentially all of our commissions, thinking more about budgets to achieve village goals. Um, you know, historically, HRC was the only commission that got a budget. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the case, you know, when I was the liaison. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, those are just some of the did, things. That did I they fill out one of those sheets? You know, you have that really nice form because we're looking at it for other. Right. They, they did fill out the form. And that was what was presented last month. Um, but the, even the dollar amount that you see that's in HRC right now, mm -hmm. that was short $900 during our, our uh, November meeting. Uh, because there was a check floating around somewhere that we that was floating and and until we found that nine hundred dollars you know I was well short of what we were well short of what they were asking for um, so I said no we, we can't do it I wanted to you know give the give time for the check to be found find out what the real balance was and get the full story of where everybody, everyone was at the end of the year um, and, and I guess part of the concern is, you know, whether it's a standard amount or a regular amount, we're well short of that because I think this year has been a combination of maybe not the number of requests, but certainly larger requests um, that, that have come through. So um, the commission uh, is just a little closer to zero uh, at this juncture this year than they've been in the past. And I'm not advocating one way or the other um, as far as Kevin's request, but I will point out that there is $10,000 there that Planning Commission um, was allocated and has not used. Right, but they are going to be using 30000 right next year. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. You know, I, I mean, this is where to me it gets a little bit sticky, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I mean, we definitely want to support uh, lots of things, um, but I don't know. So if I were to make a um, particular request, it would be to raise the HRC balance from 1,965 to 2,500. Um. Could we make the decision at the next meeting with some something to look at? Like a <coughs> well, well, what I could offer you to look at is is the district asking for two thousand to twenty eight hundred. Mm -hmm. So again, there is a formal request again that we turned down because we. I was not comfortable with what we were showing in our balance, mm -hmm. you know. So it's they've they've done their due diligence 
you know, effectively, if I were to paraphrase, you know, uh, they acknowledged that in the past year or so, they've gotten 2,000 or so, um, and 2,800 would be nice because, uh, speaking to some of the things that Judy was referring to, uh, the, 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 the way the math works out with the number of kids and, and the various funding uh, requirements that, that still exist. So what? I'm sorry to mean interrupt, but go ahead. You know, so I was going to say, fine, let's just sort of not split the exact middle, but let's say 2,500, and um, <coughs> then if if some other <coughs> request did come up, and, and uh, as of uh, 9.41 p.m. on Monday night in the HRC account, there is no other funding request, uh, but we will meet this Thursday. It was your budget the eight thousand five hundred? Yes. Well, well, I, I, I thought it was just eight thousand five hundred. Eight thousand five hundred. Okay. And it, 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 there was a point when it was ten thousand. Right. So you might just say you'd like it to be bumped up to ten thousand. Right, but that was that was many years ago. But we reduced that budget. Can we request additional information? I mean, I agree with with Brian that I would like to know. What other funding sources, mm -hmm. um, GoFundMe's, Community Foundation, what other um, asks they've had? Because I think, you know, again, it's this idea of pulling the community together to fund these things. And uh, I think it would be nice to have it be balanced. So could you ask them for that information? I will get you the information tonight. <coughs> I mean, they've got, well, and I don't know how detailed it is in terms of other funding sources. That's, that's the, that? I think that's a specific thing that Brian mm -hmm. asked that I agree with. Well, when I say you, I meant all of us. Yeah, I mean, that's the specific question that I would like to know. Well, I, I having been on HRC in the past, I've been there when this request has come through. I, I'm comfortable just bumping up the HRC to 10,000 from 8,500, but also letting the school know that they <clears throat> maybe can't automatically count on a donation from HRC as a uh, I mean I think it's become sort of an automatic thing that it, that they come mm -hmm. yeah I, and I, I, I think HRC exists sort of not for like always funding a certain activity as much as there to help small things that are happening well, on the flip side, we did start a practice where you submit a budget as a commission, you plan out year by year, and the HRC, you know, has this data from so many years of what they allocate their budget for. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned about this. And, and again, we, we've said that next year, six commissions are splitting a budget of 25,000, which means about 4,000 each. So. But not all commi environmental commission has never spent anything essentially. Well, they're Maybe. spending now so, for glass farm, mm -hmm. glass farm management. Yeah, that's true. So, so I, I, I would, I would not ag agree, Marianne, with your recommendation because we do have a community foundation in our community who's one of major pillars mm -hmm. of their giving is school related stuff. So before we add unbudgeted amounts. I'm not saying I'll never say yes, but I think we should ask these questions about did they ask the community foundation before we make this decision? Well, each of you uh, just received the request in your email. It, hopefully it does shed some light. Um, I'm okay with putting off the decision until the next meeting. Um, it, it would be easier for me to make a decision if I had some of these questions answered. Mm -hmm. I hate to say no to things like this. I think they're valuable. Um, but I, I think the case should be made. So that's my. I don't think I, I got it. I think it's hard to come through sometimes on right. the server. Right. I'll forward it. You forwarded it to Judith. 
Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to make a motion to table this until the December 17th meeting. Second. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Opposed. Okay. All right. So it's four to one. We'll have it on the December 17th agenda. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I could, I could have said no. Okay. Said three, two. But <laughs> I'm willing to wait because I don't want to fight. And I, and I, and I will, Patty and I have had this conversation. I was trying to do a good job tracking the money all year. Um, but I was misinformed <laughs> about mm. the amount of money that was coming out uh, of the budget. I was simply uh, just tracking the funding requests. And I did not take into consideration uh, the money that was being spent uh, um, for block, block parties, parties and, and other things. And, and you know, we, we talked about this each month in the meeting, and um, I, I was not advised that the number that, what, that I was presenting to everybody each month was, was incorrect. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit because I feel like I'm the captain of the team, but it's not my fault. <laughs> so anyway, so we can well, wait. We haven't, said, we haven't right. said no yet. Right. I just no, no, want no, more no. information. So you, you've got, uh, eventually you'll, you'll get their form, um, and I will um, reach out to the school. And if this is not adequate, I will reach out to the school and ask them to get more information to us by the 17th. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank mini, you for your time. Mini retreats. Okay. So, um, well, Kevin, why don't you talk about this because you've kind of mentioned it a couple times to yeah. me. Well, I've been, um, I have no shame in uh, <laughs> taking on the um, library commission. Um, you know, I'm um, alternate on the library commission and since Judith stepped down, I figured I would just step up. Um, and I just thought that there ought to be an opportunity for us to have a full discussion on uh, where people end up, now that Kaneda's on board, where people end up as primary or uh, and alternate liaisons on the various commissions. I know that in the earlier deliberations about the Justice System Commission, uh, Brian, both you and Lisa committed to being in those roles, um, uh, but in that we do have Kinnett on board. You know, I just wondered if um, you know she might want to have a role in that Justice Commission. Um, certainly, as a, I'll call her a housing expert. Um, uh, I think I think it's fitting that she be potentially on the housing advisory board it's because it is an advisory board, not a, a commission. And I just think there's room for error as it were. So again, the point is I think we ought to be able to have a pseudo offline discussion, if you will, on where folks want to want to stand, uh, because it might mean some more shuffling uh, beyond the folks that I just mentioned. So I think the, the question on the table is, do we want to try to have a mini retreat, like maybe two hours, two hours. before the end of the year? Um, and if that is something we want to try to do, then I would suggest that Judy can try to coordinate a schedule with all of us to see if that can happen. So um, anyone uh, opposed to that if we can make it happen? Okay, so let's, let's try to do that and we'll see if we can get our schedules aligned. Um, I think there's some other things we could talk about as well. Yeah, I, I would, I see this as the first part of our planning session. Yep. It's a very, very busy time of year. Mm -hmm. So I would also encourage that we at the same time try to plan if there's another retreat time where we're going to do goals and yep. plan 2019 stuff, can we please get it on our calendars? Yeah. Yes. Good because idea. Because for me, scheduling any nearer than two weeks out is almost impossible. So that's the week of Christmas. So, so we would ask Judy to also s help send out schedules mm -hmm. for a January. goal setting. Yeah, maybe even January. a longer meeting. Yo, yeah. I think right? How long was right. planning? Four years? So I think. Four, four years. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. I know it's a Freudian slip for four years. I mean, I think. I'm not uh, coming. If, 
we can find two hours before the end of the year, that'd be great. And um, and then we can prioritize a few other things besides boards and commissions. And then maybe we're looking at later in January. Yeah, in January, like a six hour where we can deep dive into goals and everything. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I, I agree with your point, though, the Justice System Task Force is not meeting again that I know of, yeah. right? So we'll, we have to pick a time, a week, when, when the commission's going to meet, start. I mean, there's so much to oh, yeah. do to convene that commission. Well, you got to advertise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, there's People so much to do. It. So, I mean, I, I totally agree, but I'm not sure. And, Kanetta, I don't want to speak for you, but I don't see it as a huge sense of urgency to get it done this month because there's not a meeting in the cadence that's going to be missed. Do you know what I mean? Well, I, I, I think um, it's important, I think, to get folks thinking sure. along the way. You know, I'm, I'm with you, yeah. but I just, you know. Yeah, yeah, so two hours, one hour even, yep. 90 minutes, mm -hmm. yep. um, sometime this month, get the conversation going, and with respect to the things that uh, Judy just alluded to that need to be done, someone needs to take leadership in that. I think two hours would be a good amount of time because mm -hmm. it's also a time to help get Kanetta up to mm -hmm. speed with yep. things we've done yep. we'll be doing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I had committed to our last meeting having sort of that goal updated document so that we could take a little bit more time if we had in those two hours to look at that too. Okay, great. So Judy will send out some emails and see if we can get that uh, on our calendars, and we'll also think about January. Okay. So last new business, Lisa, you had two commission nominations. Yes, I would like to um, nominate uh, Saul Greenberg for the Economic Sustainability Commission. He's been serving as the chair, um, doing wonderful work, so I'd like to nominate him for a reappointment. I'll second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, I'd like to nominate uh, Cheryl Durgens for a position on the Art and Culture Commission. Uh, we came to meet Cheryl uh, because she's the uh, project coordinator that spoke to us about the Gaunt um, statue. Uh, Cheryl has an amazing background. She was the project manager in Pennsylvania for what's known as the City of Murals Project. <coughs> she has a unique and fabulous understanding about the connection between arts and the community. And through her work as a project manager and artist, has done a tremendous amount of community building and processes to gain community input and feedback on both arts-related projects and other kinds of projects. She's um, trained in conflict resolution. She's a working artist in town in multiple medias and also teaching at Wilberforce. And uh, I'm thrilled to have her join us. So I move that uh, we bring her into the commission. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Awesome. Okay, manager's report. Um, just a couple of highlights. Uh, the first is that a reminder that the crews will be picking up the limbs this Thursday and Friday, the limbs from the, uh, the ice storm a couple of weeks ago. If you have them to your curbs uh, no later than um, Wednesday evening, they will pick them up Thursday and Friday. Manageable pieces, which we're, we're hoping that that's, you know, four feet, five feet. Uh, six feet is kind of the max that they can get up into the truck. So um, think about that and the fact that they do have to get these into the truck. Um, so but the crews will be around. Uh, Patty, remind, Patty, what if I have one limb that I had down before the ice storm? I didn't hear you say that. If it's at your curb, we're going to pick it up. I, I'm just saying what a lot of people are thinking. <laughs> If it's at your curb, we're going to pick it up as long as it's not longer than six feet. Okay. How's that? That, that works for me. One time. One time. <laughs> one time. <laughs> Just one limb. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, a reminder that we are closed on December 24th. Um, thank you, Council, for that. The staff is very appreciative. Uh, the Bryan Center Security. So, um, unfortunately, I did not get this in your packet, um, Sergeant Knapp's brief, but it is at your table. Um, 
but we do have uh, a continuing issue, and it seems to be getting a bit worse, um, with um, folks who come into the lobby um, and stay and sleep and are abusive to the staff that is here in the evening. Um, sometimes, and, and by evening, I mean 11 o'clock at night until 7 in the morning, um, so the night shift dispatchers. Um, they, uh, they sometimes, uh, unfortunately, contaminate the lobby or the bathrooms in unpleasant ways. Um, so what the, I have been sp talking with uh, Chief Carlson and Sergeant Knapp about this, and what we propose is to put a mechanism on the interior door of the vestibule. So you'll still be able to come in the outside door, get out of the weather, um, the end, but you will not gain admittance into the Bryan Center lobby after 11 o'clock at night without speaking to the dispatcher and being buzzed in. Um, and that would go until 7 in the morning when the shifts pick up again. Um, and I mean, we have had to decontaminate the lobby on numerous occasions. Um, we've had to have the bathrooms um, sanitized for lack of a better word. We offer assistance to these, those who need it, um, to take them somewhere where they can stay overnight. Um, we're frequently refused. Um, they don't want to, to leave, they just want to sit in the lobby <coughs> and um, essentially demand food and drink from our staff, um, which we don't have to give them in the middle of the night. So um, that's the request is to put the system in. I have a question. Are the restrooms at the train station 24-7? No, they're not, but we will let people, obviously people will be allowed, if you read Sergeant Knapp's um, brief here, you'll be let in if you, need, if you need to use the restroom. If you, Part of the problem is people will come in the door and the dispatcher's away from the desk, either heating up their lunch or going to the restroom themselves or something. They don't even know people are in the building. And so they can get into the Bryan Center, um, access different areas, and then leave without the dispatcher even knowing. Or they'll come walking back out and the dispatcher will have no idea that they've been in the building. So. Can you say how, is this something once a night? Once a week, once a month? I would say at least once a week. Um, I mean, I don't have hard numbers, but I know it's, it's frequently. They're still here when I come in in the morning at 7.30. And, and this is a relatively new occurrence? Um, it's been getting worse for about the past year. Um, I mean, it's just, it, it, at first it wasn't, you know, a huge deal. Um, folks would come in and just need a place to get warm or, you know, stay for a while or whatever, and then they would leave. But then it became, at one point we had three people sleeping in the lobby. And so they would, as I said, they'd still be there in the morning when I came in and we started business and they're there, you know, when the, the kids are coming in. And so it's gotten progressively This is just something that I really want you to be aware of that um, we're, we're looking at this change to, to, um, to secure the building at night. Does anyone have any questions? Is, how often does someone come in because there is an emergency? Uh, and I, I'm thinking like someone comes in, there's some kind of emergency, they get in there, they can't get in, the dispatcher is making them lunch. Um, to the bathroom. It's it's not it, it it's not that frequently um, that it's a, it's an overnight emergency because most most people will call on the phone in, if it's nighttime and they have an emergency. Um, but I I mean they even if they came in the door and the dispatcher was away from the desk, I mean they would still they would hear them. Well, and also to say. Those dispatchers are literally glued to that seat. I mean, right. if they get up, it is maybe a minute and a half. Right. They they run back to that seat. There's nobody waffling around behind there. They they know they've got to be planted in that chair. Right. So it's there's not a length of time that's significant when they're not, yeah. you know, front and center. Thank you. That's a good point. So, 
Um, does anyone have any other questions? Well, well, I guess I was wondering if there's been any budgetary considerations. Um, it, it is in the budget already. Mm -hmm. um, Johnny has it. It would actually come from the Bryan Center budget. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it, it, it is in there. And, and honestly, we've probably spent that much in decontaminating the building. So let, let's say one of the one one of these the people that have been sick. I, I don't. I don't really think. I don't really support having the lobby be a place where people can come and sleep, particularly. Mm -hmm. But let's say there is someone who is homeless, doesn't have a place. They come to that door, and then they say, "You know, I need a warm place to spend the night." What would happen? They're going to be let in. And as long as they don't create a huge disturbance, then they're going to be sitting there until it warms up. Or we're, what we normally do is offer to take them to the shelter. And most of the time we're refused because they are from Yellow Springs and they don't want to leave Yellow Springs, which I understand. But so it isn't, what we do now, Marianne, is if they come in and they, they're just sitting there trying to get warm and maybe get a little bit of rest, we let them sit there. We're not going to change anything that we currently do. It's just more for us to know who's in the building and what they're doing. So it's sort of like we don't want our lobby and bathrooms to be a flop house right. where people can feel like, oh, I, I can just come in here and do whatever I want to and mess up the place, mm -hmm. and it's sort of my right. So it sounds like what you're saying is there still could be cases where so if someone could be let in because they have that need, but it would be clear that it's on a, it's not a, a right. It, 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 it's not a permanent solution yeah. to the problem. Yeah. So we, what we do is try to help them find a permanent solution. So they won't be told just like, go away. No. Yeah, I think no. that's an important clarification that no. you made, Marianne. Because for me, there's this request but then there's this underlying issue that it's bringing forward that, you know, people are homeless and, I mean, and that's need, need some place to be and part of what Lawrence maybe right. would be helping right. with. And, and, and again, what we do now is they come in, they sit down, we help them in whatever way we can. Again, this is more so we know who's in the building mm -hmm. and what they're doing I in the see. building. I see, yes, that would make a difference. Because otherwise people could just come yeah. in, right? Yes. I see. Yes. And I appreciate that we're, you know, trying to help them get to a shelter or something like that. I, I guess the one, you know, since you've talked to me about this, you know, prior to the meeting, the disconnect I have is, I mean, since it's not set up to be a homeless shelter, I think we need to, you know, I guess more softly encourage to get them to the right place. Right. So... No, I, I want us to think about that too. Okay. And, and the last thing I have. <laughs> I, well, I, I just don't know what we're doing yeah. right now, you know, so. Um, the last thing that I have just real quick is I would like to welcome Sean Devine, our yeah. new station manager. Hey, and I would also like to sincerely thank Jordan Gray for his donation of time over the last two meetings. Um, last meeting he, um, he he did all the filming all by himself. This meeting, he was here to help Sean uh, get settled on his first meeting. So uh, welcome to Sean. Welcome to the team. And thank you so much to Jordan. Yes. You're here. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Welcome aboard. Uh, Chris? Okay. Judy? You got mine in the packet. All right. Okay. Future agenda items. Um, I guess one thing we need to talk about uh, is um, what we are going to do with the uh, PUD, um, which we are going to get a recommendation from Planning Commission for. Um, Judy, do you want to just quickly outline the options that you've mentioned? Yeah. There are two ways that you can go about it. One of the ways is that you can uh, consider the proposal at the same time that you give a first reading to an ordinance to rezone. Or you can first take the proposal, weigh it, consider it, and respond, and then ask for your ordinance to rezone or not. One thing that I will say is our timing here is a little odd, but if you bring an ordinance on December 17th, it becomes a new ordinance anyway in January. So my recommendation would be that 
you, you simply hear that recommendation first and then have your series, your, ordin your two readings, which would be 2019, one ordinance, same year, clean. Um, so you've got two options in that way. I will also say that you are going to get a boatload of material that you need to review. You will have a full Planning Commission packet for the Planning Commission saw on November 12th. You will have a full Planning Commission packet for December 10th. You will have a recommendation that you have to review. You have a lot of material that you have to go through for this consideration. Marianne, you, you know the most about this. Yeah, but I, I know the most about the uh, what's been happening at planning right. commission and uh but i but i don't know about the procedure part of it which is what judy's talking about once planning commission commission makes its recommendation to council it belongs to you mm -hmm. you get to do what you want with that recommendation but it, the result of it is that if you if your will is to permit the pud then you must rezone, which requires an ordinance, which requires two readings um, and 30 days after that. Yeah. Be, yeah. We'll stop there. So I guess the, the question that I asked when Judy uh, mentioned this to me before the meeting was how that affected the timeline um, of the project. And my understanding is that um, if we agree to move forward on December 17th, we can write a letter to that effect, and that should uh, address whatever, you know, uh, home ink Yeah, it's, it's sometime in February they need to. It's mid-February, so mm -hmm. even if you couldn't reach a conclusion on the December 17th meeting and needed to carry it over, I mean, worst case scenario, if you are into February, you're already into the ordinance reading process. I don't, I don't think that there would, you would be giving every indication as a council that this is going to go forward and could indicate that in a letter. <coughs> and by the time probably that that uh, application is being seriously reviewed, the app, the, you could send on, you know, supplemental material, which would be the ordinance had passed. So, so a question, we rezone it as a PUD, that's one thing then is it a separate thing to say and we accept the concept of this PUD plan or is it No, one? you have to first say this is the PUD that we agree to. You, you okay. wouldn't rezone that okay. area until you had first determined that you agree to the to PUD. To this PUD. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I would rather them come separately. Um, so unless there's anything that I'm misunderstanding that would potentially, you know, cause the pro project not to be able to go forward. That makes the most sense to me. Come, what comes uh, up? That we make a decision about the recommendation on the PUD, oh, okay. and then we do our two readings of the ordinance oh. in January. And, and that would affect it. Would have an effect if they come roughly February twenty first. Mm -hmm. So, I and, agree with you, Brian. And I think Kaneta need will need to recuse herself. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay. So we got that, that settled. That. Anything else on future agenda items? Obviously, we mentioned a couple things. Uh, there's plenty already on there. Yeah. Um, anything? I, I know I've taken it off and put it on several times, but I would like just very short amount of time, maybe 10 minutes max. For a short special report from the Economic Sustainability Commission about this uh, marketing and branding the CBE land, particularly in light of uh, that we're going to start doing any kind of planning, I I want to I want to have council look at this little just mm -hmm. one pager. Um, so what do, what do you think you need? So maybe ten minutes. Okay. Can I just make a quick suggestion while we're talking about the CBE? Because we, we keep saying formally known as the CBE because we do, it's not the CBE anymore. Can right. we call it Village Edge or something? I just 
Yeah, I, I don't. Why I can't we just have the CBE name? I, I don't. I don't know. Center for I, I think I don't have enough history with the organization to. Well, it's currently are. known as, but you know, part of this effort may be that it gets rebranded. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. Yeah, that's so. what we're doing. Then, yeah. Right. So then that would be the time to change right. that. Right. right. Yep. I would also add. I think the zoning code refers to the CBE by that mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're updating our uh, comp plan, so. Right. <laughs> it's the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. I guess that's another thing that we've talked about a couple of times: updates to. Like, for example, specifically, the I keep thinking about the mayor's term being two years, being... Oh, the charter, you the mean. The charter, the charter updates. Right. And charter review. Charter review and updates. Um, okay, well... I know that's, like, bigger than a bread box, but I just want to keep it out there. Yeah. Uh, let's put it for the second meeting in January, Judy, just to have a place marker, and which, then we'll see. Which thing are we uh, Charter uh, review. Because at some point there are some things that we need to look at, and we have some notes from the last process that you know mm -hmm. Chris knows about. Um, okay, anything else? Yeah, you want the HRC request to come back in what format? Just a item, or do you want a discussion on that? And then you had village manager search updated timeline, details of the implicit bias plan, and that's all I got for your extra stuff. Yeah, and the details on the implicit bias plan it will just be um, a document in the. Uh, in the packet, right? It won't be a discussion a, a item. From me. HRC will be a discussion item. Okay. Um, anything else? Um, the evaluations? Yes. Yeah. So you want to do the 2019 goals? I mean, it's on so that. What, I'm, what I'm planning to do is take our 2018 document, um, and remember mid-year mid we changed, you know, the color coding based on what we've done. I'm going to bring that forward to the end of the year right. to tee it up for 2019. Okay, so that's really the same thing. The yeah. end of the year review. Yeah. It's, it's not a separate well, thing. Uh, <clears throat> Lisa and I are going to have a brief what we've accomplished in 2018. And yeah, yeah, they could, they could be tied together. Potentially. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get too far into 2019 draft goals until they're planning, right? Right. I agree. Yeah, I mean, really what it is is our eight core goals are not going to change, right? What's going to change is the activities, so I, probably not anyway. I mean, if we, if we can simplify the agenda, I think that would be a good thing to do. So I, I'm not sure we're going to be talking much about draft goals for 2019 that's all I'm saying yeah the wording is probably wrong on that okay end of year well, review I think Clutter. Right. well and I also say that y you probably need to just have it in your mind how much time you're going to allot to that uh, discussion around the PUD proposal as to whether you will continue it over whether you want to whack some stuff out of this meeting because that's uh, realistically that might be an hour mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. And there'll probably be a lot of public comment. Yes. If you permit it. <laughs> but you will also receive, as part of that packet, the um, minutes of Planning Commission, which contain all those public comments which have already been made. So you can choose to hear them all again and perhaps have to continue your hearing on, or you can say, these are, we already have these on record, <coughs> and we will take, you know, new things. You have a way to kind of contain all of those comments and, and kind of also contain how much time you're taking to hear new or, or repeat comments um, that's in your if, control. If we're going to do that, should we let the community know because there's one more planning commission meeting? That not is not a public them, hearing. But, oh, it's not a public. Okay. I just feel like people may be very feel very uncomfortable if we don't take comments. And there's definitely the, the latitude exists for that if there is something that has not been reflected in what you have before you because what you're to consider is what Planning Commission is, is you know, passing on to you and then if there's something that supplements that, that is a, of course appropriate to hear and to take in. So, I mean, there's a way, I think, to, to manage that and still 
you know, get that input. Yeah, the challenge is most people probably won't read the packet to know what comments have already been made. But, I mean, I think, yeah, we, we do have to think about that. Um, not that I want to add any more work to Judy's already heavy schedule, but maybe um, just taking the comments section out of the minutes and putting it on a separate document that's available <coughs> on the table for folks to see the comments that have been made. We might be able to bullet them. I put in them in pretty that, bullety fashion. Okay. So, in the, cool. they're like. You just have them as a separate document that is kind of there. Yeah. I mean, I will say our rules and procedures do, you know, talk about the fact that, you know, if we're hearing the same comments, that we can sort of close the comments. So once everything's been covered. Um, all right, it'll be tricky. Well. We will figure out how to try to make this uh, next agenda manageable. All right, anything else? All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. I second. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. No, <laughs> 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 Good meeting, Kevin.